Joining me now is the president of United Nuclear. That's a company that sells all sorts of scientific equipment and materials online. The owner is a guy best known for other things, though, specifically Area 51 and UFOs. But for now, we're going to talk hydrogen. Bob Lazar, good to have you back on the program. Well, how are you doing, George? <laughs> how the heck are you doing? How's life? How's it going in general? It's it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It was uh, quite a change moving from New Mexico to Michigan. You know, I was born out on the East Coast, and, uh, you know, I've lived in the Southwest the majority of my life. And, um, you know, moving back to Michigan where there's actually moisture in the air and, uh, you know, wide temperature swings and being reintroduced to mosquitoes, I mean, it's uh, it's quite a change. <laughs> You're just going to love your first Michigan uh, winter coming up here, I'd imagine, aren't you? Well, I actually was here through part of a winter last year, but, uh, you know, numbers like 10 below are kind of scary to me. But, um, you know, it's the dark, dreary winters that uh, they keep talking about here. So we'll see. I'm sure I can take it at least for a while. But uh, I'm here for the long haul. So it's. uh... Well, explain to a lot of the the viewers, our listeners had sent in emails to me before the show. They wanted to know why you picked Michigan. Why and why not uh, uh, the big city in Michigan if you're going to go up there and develop a hydrogen system? What was the deal? The deal on that? Well, boy, that's got to be the number one question that people ask me. Um, well, it was really a, a – mainly it was a family thing. Um, uh, Joy's son, Chris, and his wife, Emily, had a uh, baby recently, uh, making me uh, a grandfather, <laughs> So, um, which is a unique experience in itself to me. But, uh, you know, the new little guy, Sullivan uh, – lives out right in mid-Michigan, right outside uh, uh, Lansing. So, um, you know, as far as moving the business, that needed to be done anyway. We were bursting at the seams, and we needed to expand to, uh, you know, get away just from our uh, sales of scientific materials and uh, equipment uh, to getting back into doing contract work for the government and military, and then also adding on a third division, uh, you know, the hydrogen fuel system development. So one of the reasons was Michigan, of course, has plenty of unemployed auto workers, some of them extremely talented and some of them, you know, desperately in need of a job. And certainly we thought, you know, once we get this thing up and going and we start needing uh, large amounts of people, we already have uh, a pretty well-trained workforce. Um, So that coupled with, you know, the desire to see the new little guy uh, needing more space and just kind of wanting to get away from the dry southwest. We'll get into the hydrogen. We'll uh, we'll get into the hydrogen uh, uh, technology in a moment. But, uh, you know, last time we talked to you, you had a suite set up there in New Mexico. You had like five acres of land. It was picturesque and beautiful. You'd built this facility in the back of your house with this 30-foot-long particle accelerator as part of your system. And I remember when you were on the show the last time, uh, you had just had some trouble with government folks who showed up at your house one day with Uzis and and were very angry with you for what you were selling over the Internet, right? Well, or so that was what they claimed the problem was. You think it was uh, related to hydrogen? You know, who knows? You you know, it's... uh... It just, it's hard to say, but, um, you know, still, um, the thing that they said they came down for essentially was we were selling um, various uh, combinations of chemicals and supplies that could potentially be used to make exploding fireworks, that sort of thing, or explosives in general. Um, they never did take any of that material. The only material they actually physically took from us was, um, and still to this day, it, it remains missing, were the original plans for the hydrogen fuel system, which has, you know, always been a thorn in my side. But, um, you know, still, it was a, it was a long court battle, and, um, you know, essentially we came out. I wouldn't say we came out ahead, but uh, things didn't go as badly as uh, we first thought. Well, you didn't go to prison. <laughs> didn't go to prison and didn't get hit with the $30,000 fine, which they had um, 
you know, originally intended. I'm heading up west. Let's talk about the hydrogen system. Describe it for the listeners, how it works, and what its potential would be. Well, the hydrogen, you know, certainly running a car on hydrogen is, is nothing new. It's been done, you know, by several companies, many individuals, and it runs basically like, uh, you know, running a car on any flammable gas, propane, natural gas, whatever. The only difference about, <clears throat> excuse me, hydrogen is that um, hydrogen burns much, much faster. It has an extremely high flame front velocity. It, it almost detonates as uh, opposed to burning evenly like, um, you know, propane or natural gas does. Um, storing hydrogen is really the trick because it's a gas, and being a gas, to store it takes up a lot of volume. And you can store it in one of three ways. Uh, you can store it as a gas in compressed tanks, which means uh, compressed gas in you know, heavy tanks, like you would uh, a welding setup, for instance, which takes a heavy tank, usually thick, um, high pressure, uh, sometimes extremely high if you want to get any quantity of gas in there. And to me, although there are some tanks now that have been developed that are somewhat bulletproof, but still, you have the possibility of a uh, you know, major auto collision, compressed gas at that pressure, spewing out, igniting, you know, potential safety hazard. Um, the other way is liquefying it, where you get a much higher density, but now you're dealing with uh, cryogenic liquid, extremely cold, and you still have all the problems of a collision. These require even more specialized tanks, Dewar tanks, essentially um, thermos bottles, if you will, on a large scale. And that again, in a collision, you have a now you have a cryogenic liquid pouring all over the place, and you know potential explosions, whatever. The third and uh, most interesting way is storing it inside a metal hydride. And metal hydrides are, uh, at least ours, is a it's a granular material. It's a solid, and it's filled in a tank. And what it does, it absorbs the hydrogen gas like a sponge absorbs water. Once it's absorbed the hydrogen, it becomes chemically locked onto it. In other words, if you have the tank full of the hydride material and it's completely charged with hydrogen, I can take that tank and cut through it with a buzzsaw or shoot it with incendiary bullets, and all it will do is smolder like a cigarette. So it's a very safe way to store hydrogen. The only drawback is with most hydrides, um, there is a limited amount of charge and discharge cycles, just like a rechargeable battery, for instance. After a while, you have uh, decreased capacity, and, you know, other problems. Also, they're very sensitive to impure hydrogen. Some can't be exposed to the air, and on top of that, they're very expensive material. The hydride that I've developed has an extremely high amount of charge and discharge cycle. In fact, over a period of about seven years, from virtually daily use, we've only lost 12% capacity in storage, which is phenomenal. Another benefit of storing it in a hydride is that the density of the hydrogen is actually greater than that as if you had a cryogenic setup or a liquid hydrogen. So it's really the ultimate way to store hydrogen. And once you can store hydrogen safely in a car, um, the rest of it's pretty easy now, from a technological you had, standpoint. You had told me before, last time I saw you in New Mexico anyway, that uh, your cars were running then on hydrogen. Are they still running on hydrogen? Well, they're not right now, and that's not because they can't. It's just because of practical considerations. They're taking apart the uh, uh, tanks and equipment from there, uh, getting ready to go into production and duplicate everything. But um, 
there's one vehicle left, a uh, little Toyota Celica. Uh, that's the only vehicle we have that runs in hydrogen right now. But at one time we had a Corvette, uh, Mitsubishi SUV. What else did we have running on hydrogen? Basically, you're saying, though, that, I mean, the use of hydrogen as a gas to run cars, that's no big deal. That's been proven. You've proven it. Your cars ran for a couple of years on it. Other people have proven it as well. What you bring to the table is this hydride storage system. Well, that and also the the gas handling system and the way, the way it works, um, how would I describe that? It's not just the hydride, but also the way the hydrogen is handled and burnt and how this system interfaces with the existing vehicle. Hey, Bob, we're going to take our first break here uh, with you, and we're going to come back and talk about why this is not on the market, what the impediments are to it. We're talking with Bob Lazar here on Coast to Coast. Stay with us, everyone. Thanks for being with us tonight, everyone. think you're going to have a good time this evening. If you notice that song, Tom Petty, uh, it was from 1989. In fact, all the songs we're going to play tonight, uh, Jason Bowers, our engineer, and I picked up some good ones from uh, that year, uh, sort of to go along with the anniversary theme of tonight's show. I mentioned to Jason before we went on the air that, uh, heck, 1989, I was barely a teenager. You know, I'm kidding, of course. And, and I mentioned to him he must have been old back then. Uh, I imagine him wearing uh, John Travolta-type white disco suits and angel flight pants and asked him to send me some photos. And sure enough, um, they're too embarrassing to show, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I I do have uh, one that I sent to Tim Benal. We might post it later unless uh, Jason wants to uh, pay me off. Anyway, we're talking with uh, Bob Lazar about his unique uh, hydrogen hydride system and the promise that it holds to revolutionize transportation in this country and in the world. And uh, when we come back, we'll get into the idea of why it is not on the market now. What's the big hang-up? Stay with us here on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Knapp. We're chatting with Bob Lazar, president of United Nuclear, about his unique uh, hydrogen fuel system. Bob, is this uh, yours and yours alone, or other people have developed a similar thing? Well, this particular system is is mine uh, that I designed and actually been working on for quite a while. The um, original concept was actually back in the 70s when I started playing with hydrides, but it really didn't start serious development, I'd say, till oh, about, about seven years ago or so. Pretty good for a guy who's not really a scientist, right? <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard that in a while. <laughs> By the way, these... One o'clock in the morning shows are really a killer for somebody that goes to sleep at nine o'clock. I mean, <laughs> the coffee's beginning to kick in now, so I think I'll uh, get a little more. Well, <laughs> we appreciate you staying up, but uh, I'll only make you do this every three or four years or so. Okay, that's fine. Uh, well, describe for me uh, the big picture. Let's say you could get this thing going. You could get it to the market. What does it do? How does it transform our transportation industry? Uh, well, let, ultimate let me tell best you case. How the system works. The system comes with an at-home hydrogen generator. This device is about the size of a dishwasher and sits in your garage. What powers it is, depending on your location, it is powered by either solar panels or a wind turbine, electric wind turbine. And you kind of have your choice, depending, there again, what works best for your location, you know, where you are in the U.S. The system takes the electricity from the solar panels or wind turbine, uses that uh, to break down water and produce hydrogen and oxygen. Nothing new. This hydrogen generator is very efficient and produces hydrogen at a fairly modest rate. What it does is all day long the generator remains in the garage or wherever you put it in your house produces hydrogen, and just stores it. Now, when you come home after a day of driving, you're not going to use the car anymore. Open the garage door, put the car in, connect it to the generator. It takes the hydrogen that's produced all during the day and slowly begins to compress it into the metal hydride. Now, it can't be done fast. You can't fill this particular type of hydride or really any hydride that I know of, very quickly, 
And while the hydride is being filled, it produces heat, which has to be removed. And that's part of our unique system. These tanks we call smart tanks have a way of dissipating the heat produced inside. And also there is an electronic monitoring, monitoring system in the tank that provides data to the computer of hydrogen quantity, pressure, temperatures, all kinds of other parameters. The tanks in a car typically will get you about 325 to 400 miles on a fill. Now, 90%, probably more like 95% of the people in the United States don't drive that much in a single day. So typically, if you're only driving, say, 100 miles or less, uh, you always have a surplus of hydrogen. So you're basically just topping off the tank every day. The tanks don't have to come out of the car to refill it. You just connect a hose to it. There's a little fitting on the back where your gas cap would normally be. And the car at any time can still run on gasoline. In other words, if you wanted to take a cross-country trip, you can start off on hydrogen. When the hydrogen runs out, the car will fairly seamlessly switch back to gasoline and continue on. So it really takes care of the driving, your normal day-to-day -day going to work, um, you know, 95% of the driving. It would be great in a delivery truck situation, um, and we have a couple companies that are really interested in, you know, trying the system out on a large commercial scale. But basically, that's, that's how the system works. There's a couple problems that have to be ironed out. They're more legal concerns, not technological problems. For instance, hydrogen is an odorless, colorless, flammable gas. And if there is a leak, it's a difficult thing to detect. Where if you had a natural gas or propane leak, uh, because of the odors that are put into them, that's pretty obvious. But with hydrogen, you can't put an odorant in it or the hydride, well, the hydride just won't let you do that. It won't store it. It'll poison it and become non-functional. So we have to rely on electronic detectors for any potential leaks. However, there's never more than about a liter of hydrogen in the system at any given time. So, um, you know, there's a couple little problems that we have to make it, you know, essentially street legal. But... As far as the actual operation of the system, uh, its efficiency, its reliability, that's all been ironed out quite a while ago. But this is a, a game changer. You're not talking about, as the oil companies and auto companies are talking about, uh, yeah, we're going to have a hydrogen system where you drive your car to the hydrogen gas station. You're talking about people making their own at home where they don't need the gas station anymore. And I would think that the principal um, obstacle to you getting this on is more political and economic. I, I can't imagine that the oil companies uh, are real crazy about this idea. No, I can't imagine they're crazy about it either. And of the larger companies I see interested in producing hydrogen vehicle prototypes, again, they're doing exactly what you said. They're just they're trying to switch from a gasoline economy to a hydrogen economy. Well, to me, you're missing the whole point of hydrogen. The reason hydrogen is so great, aside from the environmental factors, that the only exhaust in burning it is water vapor, steam essentially, and maybe, you know, a, a drop of oxides of nitrogen, but that's really negligible. But it's essentially completely clean burning and actually adds moisture to the atmosphere. The, the great thing about hydrogen is it's so easy to make. All you do is pass electric current through water. There's other ways to produce it and of uh, varying levels of efficiency. But if it's that easy to make, it, it's ridiculous to buy it. And with our system, essentially you buy, you buy the entire kit, the home generator, the conversion kit for the car, and that's the last time you ever buy fuel. And if you sell your car, the kit's completely removable. 
you pop it out of your car, pop it into the new vehicle. So I believe it's a great system. Um, I'm a, obviously a big fan of it. I have quite a big list of people waiting uh, for the kits to become available. And it's now it's just a matter of production. I would think that the uh, the oil companies would send hitmen uh, to take care of this. Or worse, they would send teams of lawyers to tie it up forever uh, because it basically puts them out of business. I mean, the potential for economic disruption, I guess, from their perspective, it would be tremendous. Well, you know, you hear all kinds of stories like that. And I always poo-poo the government conspiracy guys and you know and until until little things start happening i had somebody from uh a government agency and the reason i don't want to say who it is is i i don't want to start a fight right now because, you don't want to antagonize them so they come knocking on the door again yeah well they already did and their comment was verbatim you know, where you were speaking about the hydrogen car and looking at it, and he, his exact words, which really shocked me, was, now you really don't think you're going to be allowed to get this on the road, do you? Now, it really took me back because I thought we were past that. And, you know, what? why would a government agency have anything to, well, Boy, I could just ramble on here. I'm not going to. Well, you don't, don't want to get yourself. I antagonize them, right. but, boy, you know, you guys have to see this benefits you, too. It really, it really does. But I, I don't know where it's going to go from here. I'm going to do everything I physically can. It's taken longer than expected. Uh, we're expanding our business, and I'm trying to incorporate all three of our businesses into one building. And really, the only reason it's taken so long, I really thought these would be rolling off the production line already, was it's basically my fault. I um, generally insist on <laughs> doing everything myself and are a little bit of a control monster when it comes to things like this. And uh, we've had a lot of people interested in investing in it and you know, helping us out financially in different ways. And, you know, there are so many hydrogen scams out there now and so many ridiculous claims you see all over the Internet that, um, you know, I wanted to be completely self-financed this, which I knew was going to take longer. And that's what our scientific sales division uh, has basically funded this from the beginning. And once we start producing some of the generators initially and then some of the kits, Profits from those will increase production and things of this sort. Well, we've had a lot of complaints from potential customers already that things are going too slow. You know, if we would have taken investors on, we could have got the, gotten this going sooner. And, you know, they probably are right. In fact, obviously they're right. But uh, it's just really me being hard-headed and wanting to do this without any assistance is really what the delay is. Well, I mean, and that knock on the door, though, and not to belabor the point or try to get you in trouble, but it seemed that that knock on the door is a problem you're going to have to face again. I mean, the implication well, is that it. Yeah, the this implication really is this. It. If I have to spend, you know, all our finances fighting this in court, it, we're not going anywhere. And this is exactly what happened last time. It brought us to a dead stop because you can tie things up in court forever. And I, I just don't want this to happen. So I'm just trying to move ahead as fast as possible and get the systems out. And if we, you know, run into legal problems, we'll just deal with them one at a time. But, you know, boy, is anybody actively trying to stop this? I'm, I'm beginning to think that's what I should expect. Well, the implication that these government guys came and said uh, to the effect, do you really think you're going to get this on, is that they are there at the behest of somebody else. I mean, big oil or big industry or big auto or something like that. And uh, the suggestion that or the, even the implication that government agents would be there working for them against the public will, I mean, that's uh, – and against the public interest, that's pretty scary. And I don't know if you want to go into that or not. Well, I guess not. <laughs> yeah. 
Right? Like I said, right now nothing has happened, and we're just getting ready to move into a new location to start the production of these. So, man, yeah, I, I don't want to antagonize them. Certainly I'll, I'll start screaming, the, you know, if, if uh, they go on the attack. But right now maybe it was just a guy saying something off the cuff, you know, coming up with his own personal comment, and maybe it was a warning of, you know, horrific legal battles yet to come. But there is no reason that this system – should not be made available, or I shouldn't be allowed to sell this. It's safer than gasoline. It, you know, certainly friendly to the environment, and it's something. Once you feel that freedom, that it's like being off the power grid. You know, once you make your own fuel, and you're essentially doing it at close to zero cost. It's a completely green system. It's a great feeling of freedom and you know i think it's going to be an extremely popular system tell me this uh, i think you told me the last time we talked that the government of michigan the state there had indicated that it would support this in some way have they been helpful they have the the state this state has been just more than helpful and uh, even the town that we're in I, when we first moved here they did everything they could to make everything go smoothly. They even got the local colleges to interview and hire people for us. The uh, We were invited to lunch with the governor and uh, have had several meetings down at City Hall. I spoke with the mayor recently who's doing everything in his power. He's behind us 100% trying to uh, get us into this uh, new larger building so we can you know jump on this as quickly as possible so we yeah talk about assistance they are they are the most helpful uh local government i have i've ever come across and this is certainly in contrast to new mexico which seemed to do everything in their power to thwart anything we were doing well, I would think that if, you know, given the power of the auto industry in Michigan and the political power, that if uh, if the state and the local governments are helping you, that maybe the auto industry itself is not necessarily opposed to the idea. I mean, I, I guess it doesn't matter to them what fuel uh, works as long as it keeps them in business. Maybe so. And, that, you know, hopefully that's that's true. Anything uh, else you want to say to the listeners on this topic about how they could help you in this regard, help you get it on? I don't know how they could help at this point. Um, but, I mean, public support has to count for something on this. Yeah, it, it does. You know, I mean, there's no place to, you know, do a, a letter-writing campaign or anything like that. It it really just remains to be seen how things are going to go if we're – just going to be allowed to operate like any other business or, you know, we're going to be hit with a sledgehammer every time we try and move forward. Uh, It's going to happen soon, so uh, we'll see exactly how things progress. But right now it's just a matter of uh, financially being able to get into a new larger location and and get things moving on, you know, on the limited budget. But uh, I know it's, like I said, it's something – we should have been, we should have already been in production and had things moving, but I'm pretty sure that uh, somewhere in January and February we'll start firing up some of the uh, new prototypes and hopefully have at least the generators uh, going into production in you know the very near future, and that will be followed very shortly by the car kits and certainly in the future there's also uh as your hydrogen generator produces surplus hydrogen uh, home generators for backup electrical power and you can run everything from your oh your gas stove to heating and cooling units on it so there's a lot of a lot of potential down the road aside from uh automotive applications so i'm pretty excited about it and well, awesome. If you uh, if you run into some trouble, you have an open invitation to come back to the program and 
scream to high heaven if you want, and uh, <laughs> we'll see if that helps. I want to ask one other question before we go to the break and shift gears. Uh, the last time we talked, you had had a really interesting uh, episode because of something you were selling over uh, – uh, we don't have time for that. I want to get into the polonium thing, and then we'll bring on uh, John Lear and Gene Huff. Stay with us, everyone. We shift gears into the subject of Area 51 after this break here on Coast to Coast AM. I'm going to ask one more question of our guest, Bob Lazar, uh, non-UFO related. Then we will take our break, get that out of the way, and bring on our other guests, uh, Gene Huff and John Lear. Bob, uh, the last time we had you on, it was uh, not that long after you had a, an encounter with the government there in New Mexico about something you were selling online. And and the reason it uh, became uh, national news is because this particular element was used apparently to kill a Russian spy. And uh, so national news networks start asking questions about uh, the element. I think it's polonium. And uh, lo and behold, they find this guy in New Mexico who's selling it, right? Yeah, they – I guess not knowing very much about polonium-210, which was the isotope that was used, they went and Googled it. And if you, I, I don't know if it's still the case, but I bet it is. If you Google polonium-210, United Nuclear comes up and probably our sales page with it right on there. We sell a wide variety of radioactive isotopes, polonium-210 being one of them. And not knowing much about it, so they pretty much just came to us and said, what, what's the deal, and how could you possibly be selling this? And we're really flipping out over the whole concept. But it, uh, as it turns out, the quantities that we sell and are permitted to sell are so small, you'd have to spend you know, thirty or $40,000 and take a year of your time trying to mine the little invisible specks of the isotope out of the plastic disc that they're in and you know, collect them all. And you couldn't even buy that quantity from us, nor could you physically remove the material uh, to poison somebody with. So what they were concerned about was pretty much impossible. And it's legal to sell the material. It just is one of those things that sounds scarier than it is. But I can see somebody saying, why the heck is this guy selling polonium in any quantity along with all the other potentially dangerous stuff that you sell? Well, everything's potentially dangerous. I mean, if you go to a grocery store, everything from you know, Drano to Clorox is you know, potentially fatal as ingested. But, you know, science, chemistry, even physics all has uh, materials associated with it that are, you know, potentially dangerous from high voltage generators to toxic chemicals and things of that sort. And United Nuclear has really done as much as it can to bring back science. And if you remember it, when we were kids, everybody used to have chemistry sets. You know, they said it in the 1960s uh, in households that had children Almost 60% of them had chemistry sets in them. Now, if you see somebody with beakers and flasks, you can almost be assured <laughs> that he's going to be cooking meth or, or something along those lines. So it's, it's really taken, taken a turn. And what we're trying to do is, is bring it back the other way, is reintroduce science, kind of bring the fun back into it. So we're you know, trying to get our hands on all this neat science equipment that's pretty much been lost and has dropped out of American culture. And uh, we've done a pretty good, pretty good job of it. And you had said that it was like the government had declared war on chemistry or something by trying to take all this stuff uh, off the market, uh, especially buying it over the Internet or online, uh, that they didn't want people to have these capabilities for themselves. No, we were actually told that. I, I can't remember exactly what agency uh, said that because so many have come and paid a visit to us. But they said, you know, if we could, we'd like to get uh, chemistry and scientific supplies. We're talking about, you know, and any chemicals, beakers, flasks, that sort of thing, out of the hands of the general public because it's simply too dangerous for them. And statements like that just really tweak me. 
Now, everything you take for granted these days, from <laughs> the DVD players to uh, circuits that run your car to your home computer, all of the guys that developed this were those little science nerds that sat at home and tinkered with things. And guys like you. <laughs> pretty much so. I fit the mold. But they all have common background. And you can't, it's, it's stuff like this that stimulates their minds when they're young. And it's, it's just how science grows. And you, you can't take this stuff away from them. It's only dangerous if you allow it to be that way. Um, you know, certainly there are some things that are more dangerous than others, but you can't, you can't just ban it all like the state of Texas did. They kept uh, busting meth labs, and again, ignorance seems to lead the way. They kept seeing these beakers and flasks at every place they went to, so they just assumed, well, this glassware seems to be prevalent all the time. We need to ban it. Well, you can cook meth and mayonnaise jars, but chemistry requires special glassware sometimes. So they went ahead and just banned the sale of certain types of glassware. Well, moves like that are ridiculous, and you see that more and more often, and we're just trying to do whatever we can to reverse that. You know, certainly if there are specific chemicals or things you need to control to stop producing, you know, dangerous narcotics, of course, do that. But really pay attention to what you're doing. You know, each time you create a new law and ban something, you take away a freedom. And that can have some really far-reaching effects. Well put. We're going to take our break now. When we come back, we jump into the Area 51 story, 20th anniversary of the UFO's Best Evidence uh, Expose, and we'll be joined by John Lear and Gene Huff. Stay with us here on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. All right, we're getting right into the story of Area 51. 20 years ago this week, it sort of all came spilling out in a program we produced called UFO's The Best Evidence. Uh, the three amigos are here, the three guys who played a central role in that story coming to light. Uh, John Lear, uh, who's been a guest on the program many times. Gene Huff, who's a, a friend of Bob's and mine and has been here as well. And, of course, Bob Lazar. John, I want to start with you. Uh, the question is actually for all three, but I, but I want you to start it. Um, you know, we get a lot of, uh, even this many years later, a lot of people who write in and say, it's a bunch of malarkey, it's baloney, you guys are disinformation agents, you're making this stuff up, it's a scam. I wonder if you uh, take the time and if, if it's worth the effort to try and convince people that it is real after all this time. Well, you know, what I what I say is that uh, Bob took us out there at 9 o'clock on Wednesday, March 22nd, 90, uh, 1989, and he told us before exactly what time it was going to come up, a day before. So we go out there and we watch this thing come up and fly around and go down. And uh, I saw it through my Celestron 8 telescope, so I saw it. And uh, the question now is, well, maybe he was just a cook. Well, if he was just a cook, then that means that the, all they do is, you know, they all their secret information goes to the cooks out there. And, Gene, you've sort of been the, the window to the world for Bob in, in many respects, uh, answering questions when he doesn't want to answer them. Is it worth it uh, to try and make the argument anymore? You know, uh, for a long time, we I think we've just decided to sit back and let things unfold as they will. And, and uh, George, thanks to you, you, you uh, courtesy copied me a lot of the emails to get sent to you. And, uh, John, I, I know Bob's aware of this. I emailed it to him. But, John, this, this uh, former uh, senior Lockheed, uh, senior engineer, Boyd Bushman at Lockheed Martin, I guess, has come out saying that, you know, the government does have alien technology and, you know, what it's being tested for and used for. Again, another grand old gentleman, a wonderful guy to watch in an interview, and and as not to divulge any government information that he was privy to under, you know, under his uh, secrecy agreement when they when he was interviewed and asked what type of technology he was talking about, he referred them to the Lazard tape. 
<laughs> with them. He said, that's all I'll say. So I think it's interesting that this tape Bob and I and a few others essentially made, you know, on a shoestring 20 years ago is what a, a senior Lockheed engineer who's now at the end of his run in life and retiring and deciding to divulge information without breaking his secrecy agreement, Bob Lazar's information is what he gives to the reporters. So I think that speaks for itself. Bob, I know what your answer is to this. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, at what point did, well, I'll put it this way. Uh, People have accused you of being a charlatan and a huckster, and you're in this for the attention or the fame or the money, uh, the money (laughs) that came with it. And uh, what they don't remember is uh, uh, 20 years ago this week, as I'm editing this stuff and getting ready to put it on the air and reveal to the world who you are, you were in the edit bay trying to grab the tape and and, uh, had a last-minute... feeling that you really didn't want to go through with it, sort of a, a reluctant huckster. <laughs> That's true. First of all, i got to say hi to John Lear because I I just haven't talked to him in a long time, and uh, I probably should give you a call once in a while, John. Sorry, I don't know. Yeah, it's 18 months, two uh, weeks, and yeah. <laughs> three days. But who's counting? And I do have to say one thing. I mean, generally, I give John a lot of crap because I think he's crazy at certain times, but um, uh, once again, and this has happened before, uh, on a particular topic, I think years and years ago, John had mentioned, uh, aside from his claims that there had been extra flights to the moon and people are out there all the time, that there was water on the moon. And I remember, you know, laughing and I'm going, Dan, that's just ridiculous and Shut up, and it's just another Lyranism or something along those lines. But here it is, 2009, and they've confirmed that there's water on the moon. So I'll say it publicly, John, you were right. <laughs> George, you know, I, I, I hate to say how, how, how sane John has become in recent months and years, but a few weeks ago when I found out NASA was going to bomb the moon, to check for moisture content, I made the call to John Laird and said, okay, now, John, why are they really bombing the moon? I mean, what an opportunity for a conspiracy story. And all John said is my back hurts from my operation a year ago, and I think they're just checking for moisture content. So <laughs> I was never so let down for a, searching for a John Lear conspiracy in my life. I don't think the world is ready for a sane John Lear, so <laughs> let's just leave it at that. But Bob, I'll go back you... to the question. Well, do you get do you get hassled about it, Bob? Still, people stop you and ask you about it, and they say, "Yeah, well, where's your school records, and why didn't you prove this?" Well, you know, I'm I am so tired of. First of all, I I don't chase the topic. I don't pay attention to it. I, um, you know, for the people that think is that, that this is some kind of hoax or whatever, you know, the the only thing I can say is, number one, you know, it's it's an incredible story, and if you don't believe it, good for you. Because, quite frankly, if the tables were turned, I couldn't believe it either. I mean, you have to take things with a scientific approach and be as skeptic as possible. I can't present enough evidence, again, if the tables were turned, to satisfy my needs to say, yeah, that absolutely happened to this guy. And it's just not physically possible. I can't take people there, as I've said before. I didn't come out with much evidence, and there's, you know, a considerable amount of disinformation that have been splashed around concerning my name and, you know, events, things I've done, whatnot. So it's it's a hard uphill battle. So, again, all I can point out to is, number one, the, the events did occur exactly as I say, Number two, if you if you think I did it for attention, you obviously don't know me because I do everything I can to stay away from. I'm not out doing UFO talk shows. Well, this, of course, is one, but you know it. Maybe once every three years I'll do it if I'm bugged enough, uh, <laughs> only because we're friends. But I'm not on the UFO circuit. I don't, uh, you know, attend these conventions or sell things so on and so forth. Um, I really just want to be left alone to do my work. So as far as being in the public spotlight, I hate that. If you think it makes money, again, you don't know much about it. Um, There's really no money to be made. If anything, it is real difficult to overcome the stigma of being the UFO guy. Uh, We do 
government contract work and consultation for many companies, and it's, you know, it's a difficult thing to have that hanging over your head. Hey, aren't you that guy that thinks that there are aliens somewhere? Yeah, that's, that's me. You know, and they have second thoughts about us developing a product for them. But uh, so if anything, <laughs> I would say it's had an overall negative effect. So they, there's really no motive to do this. I certainly have better things to do with my time, and I have such limited time as it is. Like I said, I don't, I don't even want to be involved with the topic, although I feel extremely privileged that I was at that time. And in some respects, miss it. But George, before Bob turns the entire universe off of ufology, <laughs> yeah. I'd like to interject that with the advent of Bob Lazar, you know, the world has turned 20 years ago. I didn't hear the Vatican commenting on life elsewhere, and I think everybody in the country who saw the AP story it was on the front page of the Review Journal here in town about the Vatican, uh, you know, calling a gathering of world scientists together to examine the possibility of extraterrestrial life and see how it fits into their perception of God's children. Uh, I don't think that was happening 20 years ago. 20 years ago, certainly uh, Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon, you know, a, a Ph.D. in astronautics, uh, you know, was not on the record, at least, as as saying that uh, he had any knowledge after investigate, doing his own investigation, which included coming here to Las Vegas and speaking directly with Bob Lazar. I was there at that meeting. Now Edgar Mitchell is on the record. I think there's even a, a, a video clip of him at the beginning of the moving, you know, the movie The Fourth Kind on abductions that came out this past week. There's a clip of Edgar Mitchell. And here, here is a, 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 a brilliant man, a, a scientist, a NASA astronaut, six man on the moon, saying that he has seen sufficient evidence to his satisfaction that, you know, there has been life from elsewhere that has visited Earth and the U.S. government's covering it up. So a lot of this started as egotistical as it sounds with UFOs, the best evidence, and with the Bob Lazar story 20 years ago. So whether Bob, look, Bob clearly Bob hasn't been actively involved in, in putting this forth and bringing it to the limelight, but the world is turning, and it, and it began with him. Uh, Bob, back to you for a second. Uh, you know, I remember there was a, a point that you, where you reached that you uh, sort of gave up on trying to convince people that it was real. Uh, you know, of course, there were questions about your background, your schooling, uh, your employment record, and we'll cover some of that ground over the next couple of hours. But at some point, you just said, well, what's the point? Um, I'm never going to convince people who don't want to believe it uh, because you can't take them out there and show them the craft or beings or anything like that. There, there's always going to be another question, right? Right. And but again, I, I I don't pursue that. I don't try and convince anybody of anything. I really just let it be. Uh, as far as people asking me questions, you know, they, I, I get those constantly, and there's a point I do have to make. Uh, I'm not involved with them, but on Facebook and MySpace and these other social networking things, there are, <laughs> to my surprise, a countless number of Bob Lazar impersonators. And I go on these sites and click on these Bob Lazar links. There's pictures of me, and there are people that are fielding questions as if they're me. It's, it's mind-boggling. But I really do have to say, if anybody is going on these sites and asking questions and getting answers, it's not me. I'm never on those sites, and the only place you could ever contact me would be at unitednuclear.com. And, you know, I have limited time to answer emails, but I do get, I do get uh, UFO questions here and there and, you know, kind of throw them on the side and over time do answer them, but really be very skeptical of uh, anybody that says that they've contacted me or I've responded to emails on any of these uh, social networking sites because it's it's not me. One of them I think is the guy's name is UFO Badass or something. And there's even <laughs> sites that uh, claim that uh, my wife put up this site, and that's why it takes a little time to get answered. I mean, all of this is complete bunk. I'm not on 
any George, of those things. Hey, it's like your uh, Elvis. <laughs> you have El- Bob impersonators, like Elvis impersonators. John, we need to take a break. We're going to come back and jump into this with you and how your life has changed uh, because of this story coming out. And speaking with our guests, Gene Huff, John Lear, Bob Lazar, don't go away. This is Coast to Coast AM. We were talking about an anniversary uh, this week uh, when uh, Bob Lazar first uh, revealed himself to the world in a program that we produced here. He's our guest along with John Lear and Gene Huff. And there's another name that uh, plays into this in a big way, and that is Edward Teller, known as the father of the hydrogen bomb. He was sort of there at the beginning of this uh, Area 51 story. When we come back, we'll jump right into that. Don't go away. This is Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. My guests, John Lear, Gene Huff, Bob Lazar. Um, This past week, there was a really great uh, UFO conference here in town, the Crash Retrieval Conference. And one of the papers that was presented was about Edward Teller. And uh, it had to do with some UFO documents, uh, supposedly uh, about Teller's knowledge of the program. The paper basically debunked the, the papers as being frauds. But I wanted to know, uh, John, you're sort of the student of ufology. Where do you think Teller, uh, what role he plays in the overall UFO picture? Well, I didn't know uh, that he was involved at all, at all until uh, Bob called him that day and asked uh, to re-enter the scientific community. And uh, did he have any uh, suggestions? Bob, that is where your involvement really starts. You're at Los Alamos and you see this guy sitting around. Tell that story. Yeah, at um, at the time I was working at Los Alamos in the Maison Physics Division, and I saw in the lab paper that Edward Teller was giving um, a talk on, I don't know, some thermonuclear weapon. Topic. FDI, wasn't it? What was that? Wasn't it on the FDI? Oh, yeah, I think it was. Gene remembers more of this stuff than I do, and it's my life. That's my position. <laughs> that's, that's why he's here. <laughs> so uh, I really had a, a great opportunity. I wanted to uh, get in there and uh, spoke to my supervisor. He said, yeah, go ahead, and it was down at the you know little lecture hall. And coincidentally, that day, I had recently moved to Los Alamos, and that day they did a front-page article on a uh, Honda Civic that I built that had a jet engine in it. And they had a front page picture of me in the car. And I went a little early uh, to try and get a good seat. And to my surprise, there was nobody around. And Ed Teller is sitting outside on this little half uh, brick wall and he's reading the local paper on the front page. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. I can, you know, go over and introduce myself. So I, I did. And, you know, we talked briefly about the um, the jet car and how it worked and, you know, why I made it, so on and so forth. And um, I can't remember really what else we got into, but we're just talking about uh, science and topics in general uh, that, you know, what, where I really wanted to uh, get to in Los Alamos is high energy, propulsion, you know, weapons, something along those lines. And fast forwarding to many years later, when I wanted to get back into uh, science, I left Los Alamos to start my own company and then kind of drifted away uh, doing various off-the-wall things and really wanted to get back into it. Uh, living out in Nevada now, and and with the nuclear test site up there, and at that time it was still running, doing underground testing, I started sending out resumes to, you know, everybody. Uh, Back to Los Alamos again, seeing if I could get into um, some of the weapon development or testing, and also to Livermore to Edward Teller. And in that letter, I referenced our meeting and discussion Uh, in Los Alamos, and some time went by, and to my surprise, Ed Teller responded. And it was from that initial meeting is what really set everything in motion. He's the guy that recommended the, well, I can't remember if that was the first or second time, but it was certainly his his recommendation and direction that got me into that job at S4. 
Well, people have a hard time believing that. Oh, heck, you got to be making it up. What does Edward Teller have to do with UFOs? And then after those programs aired here, uh, of course, there was a lot of interest in your story. And some folks from a tabloid TV show tracked down Edward Teller. Gene, pick up the story from there. You remember what that interview entailed? Well, they they asked him if he knew what propulsion systems he was aware of as far as interstellar travel. And he went through the normal ones, fission and and fusion, and they began to ask him about gravity propulsion and antimatter, and he said, uh, he just cut them off abruptly and said, look, these things are not interesting. Uh, if you, even though they were filming him, he didn't know it. He said, if you ask me about these things on camera, I'll refuse to answer. He was really a curmudgeon in his later years, and uh, and they also asked him if he uh, knew Bob Lazar, and they said, well, if we ask you if you know Bob Lazar, could you answer us? And he, answer us? And he said, look, uh, so they said, uh, do you know a person named Bob Lazar? And he immediately said, no, I don't believe I've ever heard the name. Now, this was roughly an 85-year-old man. If I asked you if you knew Joe Blow, you'd have to say, well, where would I know him from or what what period of my life? You know, give me some direction. He immediately said, no, I don't believe I've ever heard the name. And Lazar is actually a pretty common name. But uh, anyway, it was curious that how he instantly – uh, said he had never heard the name and that he didn't know Bob Lazar. But then he said if they asked him that on camera, he would sit silent because he didn't believe it was interesting to anyone. So, Well, that's odd. Yeah, yeah, it's odd behavior. John Lear, is, uh, you, know, you uh, intimated to me, I think, in late 88 or early 89 that you knew a guy uh, that worked out at uh, Area 51, and then he knew something about flying saucers, and you sort of teased me with it. That was right after, I believe, you first met Bob, or maybe had gone out to see the test flight. Have you ever had uh, doubts about his story, though? You know what the questions are. You know what the weaknesses in the story are, and we'll cover some of those. But did you have to wonder at some point, is this guy pulling my chain? No, never. Never even gave it a thought. Because I was there from the beginning. I mean, I was there from when Gene and uh, and uh, Bob came over to my house to uh, Bob was going to measure it. Uh, to uh, to make an appraisal, and the guy that was holding the other tape of the the other side of the tape measure was Bob Lazar, and the deal was that uh, Gene would do the appraisal if I would give him all my a copy of all my UFO stuff, and as we saw as we sat talking about it. Bob was just rolling his eyes. He couldn't be, you know, have expressed his disgust uh, uh, more than than he did. I mean, he was just, he said, this is ridiculous. I had the highest clearance you can get at Los Alamos. If this were true, I would have known about it. (laughs) So I was was in from the very beginning there. And then in the next four months, uh, we told him four things that, uh, or three things that um, nobody could have known of that uh, unless they were at, at Los Alamos. And we told that to Bob. He checked it out. He found they were all three true. And then that's when he made his decision to <clears throat> re-enter the uh, scientific community and try and get a job up at. Area 51. By the way, George, uh, re- back on Edward Teller, when I remember when, when Teller called Bob, uh, Bob, verify if this is true, I think he told you that he was no longer active and he was just working in a chief consultant capacity. That's didn't he? correct. Yeah, so yeah, Teller correct. never claimed to be actively involved in the program in any capacity. Well, he, he, no, he did say he was no longer involved in right. consulting, so. Obviously, if he was no longer involved at one time, he was. Yeah, right. That certainly implies he was doing something, but what his actual function was. It was well, that still would have made his word count for something. You know what I mean as far as referring someone to the program if oh, he's he, been involved. He obviously carried a lot of weight. Yeah. And, you know, you would expect him to. Hey, George, could I ask John a question? This this Boyd uh, Bushman, the, the guy, the Lockheed engineer, uh, he also said in this interview – that uh, he was aware that Area 51 was moving to Tuella, Utah. Did you ever hear of that, Duella or Tuella? No. Oh, anyway, I just thought you would be the guy to ask. But but you 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 did say that you thought Area 51 had been moved somewhere, right? 
Yeah, it, I mean, it, not Area 50, we know Area 51 is still there and functioning, but not in its previous capacity, probably. It's south. The new there's two of them. There's one south of <clears throat> Wendover, and there's one uh, in the middle of the test site between uh, Sandia and or it's uh, between <clears throat> Groom Lake and uh, Tonopah called Sandia. Well, I know of one thing that's a Tuella. It's a giant plant where they used to burn uh, biological and chemical weapons. And the reason I know that is because I got taken into custody one time when we were working on a story there. And they didn't like the fact that we had cameras. So they hauled us in to see who we were and what we were up to. Uh, so it's not without its government facilities where, and secure facilities. It's uh It's right in the middle of Utah. It's, I think, south of... Uh, South of Salt Lake City. I, I'm sorry, I'm I'm pretty bad with geography, but it's right in that general area. It's near Dugway, I know, because we were working on a story about Dugway at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's go back to uh, you know the obvious questions, Bob, that have been raised many times. People tend to forget uh, that they were uh, addressed in the very first report that aired about you. You know, uh, a lot of folks cite Stan Friedman and say, "Look, Stan Friedman proved you're a fraud. He looked for your academic records and he couldn't find them." And I applaud Stan for at least doing the legwork and trying to track down the story because a lot of other people have just proclaimed it's false without doing any of the work. But uh, people forget that that was revealed in the very first story that you couldn't verify parts of your background, uh, in particular about the education. And this is you know, why I came to you. You know, this is it, it, uh, apparently, <laughs> like you said, people they. They hear fragments of the story and then just fill in the blanks themselves. But this, this, I'm the one that came to you with this information saying, you know, I have seen systematically portions of my background evaporating. Uh, everything from birth certificates to, you know, uh, school records and work records. And I'm beginning to get concerned that the next thing that's going to evaporate is going to be me. And I said, I know this sounds like something out of this Mission Impossible or, a, you know, a, a ridiculous television show, but this stuff is, in fact, happening. And, you know, this is – this was one of the reasons why I decided to come forward because I was genuinely concerned about my life at that time. And certainly John and Gene, the two people that were around at that time, you know, you really can't get a feel of the situation – Unless you were really there and around and had a taste of what was going on, but it was this was really a frightening time. And the day that we were out in front of John's house and did the news link, um, that I was petrified that day. I really didn't know if it was safe to go home at all. And the only reason I went ahead and said anything on the air really was just to protect my life at that time. Certainly I felt it wasn't fair that this was all being kept a secret, but um, it was much more of a selfish reason. Uh, if it wasn't for that, uh, you know, I probably would never have said anything. It certainly hasn't been worth <laughs> the repercussions. But George, could we re-examine that, that Stanton Friedman allegation also? And First of all, I don't want to take anything away from Stanton Friedman. He was out there chasing Freedom of, Inf Freedom of Information Act government documents and taking the high road. I mean, he's a grand old gentleman, and I don't dislike him. However, how that story unfolded is Stanton heard all of these things about Bob Lazar, and Bob said, yes, I worked at Los Alamos. And, of course, you know that he worked for Kirk Meyer, who was a subcontractor at Los Alamos. But he said, I worked at Los Alamos. Well, Stanton Friedman heard Bob Lazar worked for Los Alamos. So he called a friend of his and said, hey, do you have any record of Bob Lazar working for, for Los Alamos? You know, and the guy looks and, no, there's no Bob Lazar working for Los Alamos. So Stanton Friedman puts out a news release, Bob Lazar never worked at worked for Los Alamos. Well, Bob never said he worked for Los Alamos. He said he worked at Los Alamos. And then once we straighten Stanton Friedman out of that, he goes, okay. And now he wants the next thing served to him on a silver platter. So, but the fact that he just made a call and said, did Bob Lazar work for, for Los Alamos? The guy said no. And then he doesn't take it any further makes me wonder about some other investigation Stanton Friedman did. If, if that was investigation, it wasn't very thorough investigation. 
Well, he did some other stuff. I mean, he checked with MIT and Caltech, and he got the same results that we got. No records that Bob was there. And, Bob, you and I have had this conversation in person, and, uh, you know, and I've, I've expressed to you that I always thought that was the weakest part of your story, uh, primarily because I just I could see you being a whiz in, uh, in science classes at MIT, Caltech, but I couldn't see you ever sitting through the other Thank kinds you, of classes you'd have to take, uh, <laughs> English Lit or something like that, to get a degree. <laughs> uh, that, you know, that, I just can well, go, go ahead. Well, I, and I just couldn't see it. And then the corollary to that that people raise all the time, well, why can't you tell us who your professors are? Where's the classmates? Why don't you show us somebody that you were in school with? Well, first of all, somebody I was in school with, you met somebody I was in school with. When UFOs, the best evidence came, that guy uh, flew up from, I don't even remember where he lived at that time. But if you recall, you met somebody immediately. Like, yeah, we, you know, we interviewed him at, at a Desert Blast event. And, uh, no, Jim Tal- at Desert Blast. I think he came – well, you met somebody else at Desert Blast, but the one that came up, um, you know, specifically for that reason from the East Coast, I think he was living out on Long Island, uh, came up and, you know, introduced himself. And he didn't know what all the fuss was about, but, uh, you know, verified I was, you know, there for at least some amount of time. And George, you sent me the email from the with the excerpts from the uh, the scientist for the Department of Energy up at Rocky Flats in Colorado, who said he remembered seeing and meeting Bob Lazar. He remembered his sense of humor. He remembered when Bob worked at Los Alamos. So, people, okay, let's say Bob never he never even went to elementary school. He's just a bright guy. He never went to school at all. The fact is, you have met and interviewed and and gotten information from numerous people throughout the years who saw Bob at Los Alamos. He, Bob got you into Los Alamos, and, and you've spoken to people who worked with him there, and then complete strangers contact you going, oh, by the way, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a scientist for the DOE, and I remember Bob Lazar. So, I mean, even if Bob never went to school, he worked as a scientist at Los Alamos. So, you know, I, I don't know how you, how you correlate that. If you think Bob didn't go to school, I don't know how you think he worked as a scientist at Los Alamos. Well, that's what I've always said is that for me, the the central uh, issue or uh, fact might have been his employment there. And Los Alamos uh, gave me the runaround over a couple of years saying that they'd never heard of him. There's no record. And, of course, we had the, the front page headline that identified Bob as, as working there as a physicist. We had the uh, entry in the phone book. Um, Kirk Meyer confirmed to me that they had hired him to work there. Or so, eventually, we got a paper trail that he was, in fact, there. And it just figures – that if he worked there in a t- scientific, technical capacity, that he had to go to school somewhere. They don't just hire people off the street. But proving it is another matter. Well, the the main question people ask really is about is about Los Alamos or or me actually being at Area Fifty One or S Four. That I mean, uh, I I think the people that are skeptical of the whole thing or people that are skeptical up to a certain point to go, okay, well, you did this. Maybe you did work at Los Alamos, but there's no way you were at Area 51. There's no way you were up at the test site. Well, you know, in secure areas, it's really difficult to prove that, you know, uh, aside from having uh, a buddy who you would have worked with, uh, you know, what can, if you worked up at the test site, if you worked in, you know, all of that stuff there is, uh, relatively classified you need at least two clearance uh just to be on the, the site you know how could you prove it what would you what would you do it's really it's it's really an impossible situation to well let me say evidence. Let, me, let me say here a year and a half ago i had my 60 uh 65th birthday and i uh, had about 25 30 people and they were people from the test site that I knew there. I flew up at the test site. Uh, I flew for Department of Energy, the B-26, the OV-10, and um, what else did they have around Hey, there? John, I'm going to ask you to hold that thought. That music tells us we need to take a break. We'll pick it up when we come back after the break with Bob Lazar, Gene Huff, and John Lear. Stay with us on Coast to Coast AM. Thanks for being with us, everyone, tonight. Uh, We're sort of in the thick of things right now with my guests, Bob Lazar, Gene Huff, and John Lear. We're going to take this break and get it out of the way. And uh, when we come back, 
I want to get into one of the most mysterious, weirdest parts of this entire scenario, and it's something called Element 115. Don't go away. This is Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back, everyone. John Lear, before the break, you were about to tell us a story about uh, so a gathering for your 65th birthday. Happy belated birthday, by the way. Why don't you pick up the story? George, we must have missed our invitations to that party, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, I had, you know, well, there were several reasons for that. First of all, you know, there's um, half the guys here were E.G. and G. I used to uh, I work for three years up there, 1989 or uh, 88 to uh, 81, <clears throat> flying the um, OV-10 and the uh, B-26. And, uh, you know, one of the jobs I had was, uh, before they'd set off an under new, uh, underground uh, nuke blast, I'd fly the perimeter of the test site at different altitudes and give them the winds so that they know which way they were going. Anyway, I met a lot of guys, and a lot of those guys were at the birthday party. So <clears throat> unbeknownst to me, uh, Bob Lazar shows up. I mean, it was unbelievable. I was shocked beyond uh beyond belief but uh bob comes in and uh after everybody has a few drink uh drinks bob starts uh, telling a few stories and you could see all these guys you know were nodding their heads and and uh yeah that's the way it happened and uh and the reason i tell that is because you said you never met anybody <clears throat> that uh that would admit that but uh if you had had your camera at my birthday party uh it would have been a different story well i'll have it there for the next one oh what's that <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'll have it there for the next one. You just have to let me know and, and make sure it's okay with those guys who show up. <laughs> okay, we'll do that. Uh, Bob, Let's. Uh, we need to recap a little bit about the science of what you dis- discovered out there, what you were exposed to. Uh, give us a thumbnail sketch of how these things supposed supposedly worked. Um, and I'm, I'm saying that because I want to lead up to the discussion of Element 115. Okay. The way the craft operates is uh, centrally to the vehicle. It has an antimatter reactor. This reactor is very small by reactor standards. It's something on the order of, you know, takes about, I would say, about two feet square. It looks like half a basketball sitting on a plate. It produces a tremendous amount of electrical energy almost as a byproduct. Its primary function is to produce gravitational waves. And the craft is actually propelled by distorting gravity in front of it and around it. It's a fantastic mode of propulsion and fantastic technology. Uh, being somebody that, you know, is fascinated with uh, you know, exotic propulsion, high-energy systems, things along these lines. This was really something I I couldn't even grasp. It was literally something that bordered bordered on being magic. It was really the most shocking thing I'd ever seen in my life, just watching components of this operate. But to make a long story short, uh, I was shown how each component operates in the craft, and then how they perform together. Essentially, there's a reactor in the middle of the craft that uses an exotic fuel, a super heavy element. This reactor, as I said, produces a gravitational wave and a huge amount of electrical power. This gravitational wave is transmitted in a conduit very similar to the way a tuned conduit, very similar to the way microwaves are transmitted. And the wave goes through a waveguide and around the inner hull of the ship. It's kind of difficult to describe exactly how the wave is split and applied around the craft, but it essentially envelops the craft in a gravitational distortion. The actual propulsion is provided by three large, I don't know what you would really call them, they're cylindrical objects inside the bottom of the craft. There are amplifiers above them that 
amplify this gravitational wave, and each of these emitters is hung on a large movable arm, essentially. The craft powers itself up, produces the gravitational distortion, and these emitters focus and move an intense focal point of the gravitational wave and can either lift the craft off the ground or create a distortion alongside the craft and have it move into it or really do a variety of other things um, that make it extremely versatile. And there's essentially two modes of operation of how the craft can propel itself. I believe they're called Delta and Omicron configuration. Omicron right, yeah. configuration is where the craft is essentially lifted just using a single emitter, a single gravity uh, amplifier, if you will, and the other two emitters are focused out in front of the craft, creating a, a small distortion in space-time, essentially. And the best way to describe it is, you know, the old bowling ball analogy. If you set a bowling ball in the center of a, a mattress and then two feet away take your foot, your fist and push it into the mattress, the bowling ball will roll to it. And it's essentially how the craft operates in this configuration. It creates a little distortion in front of it, and the craft moves forward that way. For high-speed travel or interstellar travel, the craft faces its belly towards the target, and three of the amplifiers come online. They're focused at a target in extreme distance, and they run, I can't remember the cycle time on how these things are pulsed. One sixteenth of a millisecond. Do you, are you just 16 making that up? Do you really remember that? <laughs> 16 milliseconds. And it's Omicron, not, I mean, it's Omega, not Omicron. No, it's Omicron. No, it's Omicron. And Delta. Anyway, the, uh, these three amplifiers are focused on a point of extreme distance. There's a tremendous amount of gravitational distortion, and the craft traverses, you know, very great distances in this way. And it does this multiple times to essentially making small jumps, uh, you know, to travel very, very great distances that would be impossible using any other form of propulsion. But all in all, the craft is really an incredibly uh, amazing piece of equipment. Well, Bob, those... Those small jumps are small in terms of light years, but in terms of miles in a straight line, they're gigantic jumps, aren't they? Yeah, that's that's true. Well, you, that's you guys... I, when I say small, yeah, no. we're talking in astronomical terms. Okay, you've told this story over the years, and of course you've had a range of different reactions from scientific types. A lot of folks who will say, uh, this is a bunch of baloney, this is not how science works, uh, we don't know much about gravity, but we're pretty sure it's not this... And Even then you've I had a co- that. I mean, I, I, I would have to agree. That's exactly what I thought going into it, too. But sorry. And then over the years, though, you've had other people come forward, uh, scientists who said, well, that, that really makes sense. Gene, you've sort of been the, the, the guy who's dealt with those types over the years. Uh, how would you describe uh, the overall reaction from the scientific community? Uh, and do you have support uh, for uh, Bob's explanation of the technology? Well, I think the ironic thing is that when Bob comes out and he says on camera, to your camera or whomever, uh, this this is not even connected to known Earth physics for all practical purposes. It's magic. This technology does not exist. Then he explains it. They hear it, and they go, that's crazy. This technology does not exist. They say the exact same thing Bob said and then blame him. Is the reason for it. I mean, he, you know, he has the same attitude toward it they do. Nevertheless, you can say it doesn't exist all you want, but it's there, and he saw it work and function. And uh, as far as support coming forward, I mean, just like the, you know, this guy from Lockheed Martin, uh, 
I mean, Ben Rich, back who was the head of the Skunk Works for Lockheed back in 1993, when he was giving a speech at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, said that uh, the Air Force just gave us a contract to take E.T. back home. Now, what does that mean? How does a guy who's in charge of the Lockheed Skunk Works, in charge of all the black project research and development at Area 51, make a comment that they got a, a contract to take an alien back home <laughs> back in 1993? So I think as those people come out, you know, no one, there is no perfect witness. No one can change the world. Uh, uh, remember when Corso came out and um, the, the, your, is your audience familiar with who Corso sure. was? Yeah. Sure. And, and all these guys, usually guys get at the end of their life and they decide they're not going to go to their grave with what they know. And I presume this Boyd Bushman is the same way. By the way, John, I just uh, sent, emailed you that link to that Boyd Bushman video. And uh, anyway, uh, they come out and support it, but I mean, no one's going to change the world. But no one can come out and, uh, and uh, you know, with the evidence, land a disc on the White House lawn like everybody demands. Uh, but uh, uh, as these as these men who, like Dr. Edgar Mitchell, you know, astronaut like this Boyd Bushman, like Corso, as these ex-military officers and scientists with you know security clearance who worked on all the black projects, astronauts. As more of they, these people collectively come out and say, yes, there's ET technology and the government is hiding it, uh, you know, they always come back to Bob Lazar, that support for Bob Lazar. In fact, I'd love to ask Bob, I mean, it's funny, he goes on the record, he knows what is true, and everyone always expects Bob to be thankful because a com another complete stranger came forward and said, oh, by the way, you're not a scumbag and a liar like everybody's been saying you were. I mean... You know, I don't know how they expect Bob to react. He never suspected that he wasn't telling the truth. So I think we appreciate the additional support more than he does. That's true. Uh, on on the question of Element 115, and we'll get into a description of it in a second, but sort of in the same vein, the, uh, the reaction from the scientific community, as you guys are being uh, lambasted by all kinds of people and critics coming out of the woodwork, especially about the Element 115 part of the story, or including that at least, uh, there were contacts from some pretty high-level folks uh, in Europe asking for information about how to make this stuff or how it operated, right? Yeah, that was uh, – boy, that happened quite a while ago. But I, I don't recall exactly – Some heavy ion lab in Germany? Yeah, wasn't that the yeah, heavy Darmstadt. ion lab in, in Darmstadt, Germany? Yeah. And well, aren't – I mean, weren't those the guys that first – synthesized one of the isotopes of it? I mean, am, am I remembering this correctly? Yeah, I think well, I, so. I think they did uh, 116 and maybe 118, but of course, you know, 115 didn't exist at the time that you made the statement. Uh, right. It does now. It's been made in uh, small particles, but uh, again, uh, it, it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't conform to the uh, description that you gave, the stuff that they made. It only lasted a microsecond, something of that sort. Well, and... It, you should expect that. I mean, if you if you look at any element, everything has isotopes to it, essentially. Um, you know, you look at hydrogen, the most basic of all elements. There's protium, which is the hydrogen we're all familiar with. There's deuterium, which is still hydrogen, but it's hydrogen <clears throat> with an extra neutron. And there's tritium. Again, it's hydrogen, but it has two extra neutrons. They're all hydrogen. They're all element one, but they're all completely different. And hydrogen's a completely stable element. Uh, tritium is not. It's radioactive. Its half-life is, you know, about 12 and a half years. And it emits photons. That's why it's used for all the night vision uh, watches and scopes and sights and everything. Well, it emits. Beta particles, but you know that's me oh, here and that there. What we see but the, the um, uh, it, well, well, the point being that the stuff that you saw up there was stable and heavy, and there was like 500 pounds of it. It's much yeah, different. Yeah, a tremendous from, amount of it, and it was a completely stable element, for what I was told. I detected no radiation emission from it. I detected no neutron emission. Bob, it I remember. As, hmm? I remember that, uh, you know, individual pieces of 115 that were kept, kept in those clamshell-type devices. And correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't 
it wasn't it, it it didn't have to be kept under neutron bombardment at rest for whatever reason yeah it was always it, it always had what they uh, called was active shielding and i think that's yeah I mean, we can get into that later but uh, right now i mean i just wanted to go cover the isotope question oh, okay that um you know any given element can have stable and unstable isotopes, and like I said, with the most common thing, hydrogen, 115, God knows how many isotopes it has, but there is a stable configuration of it. You know, there, that is what the craft was powered by. Now, they synthesized a, I don't really recall what it was, but they synthesized one of the isotopes of 115, and it was radioactive, and I believe disintegrated in, you know, however many milliseconds or fractions of a millisecond. I really don't recall. But if they just continue their work, and I'm sure they will, it's just a matter of time. They will, as long as they're getting funding to do this, they'll eventually wind up with an isotope of 115 that is completely stable. Bob. Well, you had said you had said in the beginning, Bob, you didn't think they could ever make it like that here. It had to be a naturally occurring element. I was very shocked that they were able to do it. I believe they used a, a nucleus fusion technique. I think one of it was a calcium and something else. I really don't recall what it was, but they they used a, a very novel method. Now they're only making you know a couple atoms of it, right. so it's not like they'll be able to detect any properties of it. But they'll certainly be able to detect. Uh, you know, a stable element. And it's just a matter of time. If they, they keep plugging away, they'll, you know, run and discover, you know, a wide variety or as many isotopes as the element has. And like I said, one of them, at least one of them, is going to be stable. The last time that Gene and uh, John were here, we talked about a cloud chamber experiment that took place at your house. And it was a very primitive sort of a thing. Uh, it was videotaped. Uh, we had a, a chunk of that videotape, and I think we included it in, in a report that we aired at one point. I can't find the original, but what was the point of that experiment? What did it show? This is back when we actually had a small sample of it. And what we were doing was to show that this unusual element had some never-before-seen property that it actually had an intense gravitational wave around it, uh, something you don't see at all, except with large quantities of mass. But we took inside a cloud chamber, uh, took radioactive particles and fired them past the piece of 115 and watched them deviate off their normal course. Um, we were planning on doing a lot more with the element, but we ran into some trouble. There's a whole story there about it being uh, removed from our possession. Well, of course, there are stories about how you got it in the first place, the assumption being you must have stolen it from uh, up at S4, right? Right. And that's not true. Well, I don't even want to get into how okay. we came up Bob, with Bob, don't you think it's a little misleading when – when they see some of these reports saying that they've made some element 115, and you explained to me how, how they detected these things, and sometimes these particles are flying by filters and they detect them. I mean, they are hell and gone from having a quantity that they could hold in their hand. Oh, never then, I mean, I don't think people even understand how little there is and how quickly – it decays when they hear a report like that. So you might want to expand on that a little bit. I mean, they're really just slamming uh, atoms together and watching this collision. This is all happening happening in tiny fractions of a second, uh, smashing you know, nuclei of atoms together and watching particles ricochet or get launched out of this collision and high-speed detectors just picking up the particles as they fly by. That's all they're ever going to do. That's all they'll ever be able to do. Well, we need to take a break here. The question I probably shouldn't ask is what happened to that sample of 115? You guys think about how you want to answer that. When we come back, we'll get into it. Stay with us, everyone, on Coast to Coast AM.
talking with Bob Lazar, Gene Huff, John Lear about Area 51, Element 115. There was a piece of it that they had for a while. Curious about uh, where that went. Also curious, and what we'll get into when we come back, is uh, the physics, uh, the technology. What happened to it? If it was 20 years ago and they were working on it then, where is it now? Stay with us on Coast to Coast. We're talking with Bob Lazar, Gene Huff, and John Lear about Area 51. Uh, Before the break, we got into the issue of Element 115. You guys had a chunk of it for a while. Gene, I'll rely on you to give the diplomatic answer. If you had it, where is it? I think it was stolen, and I'd like to start the rumor that John Lear has it right now. <laughs> I know there's a guy that's doing a lot of Bob Lazar research named Ken Yakel down in Southern California who's just shaking his head right now because he likes answers on this same subject. But uh, I think it was stolen is probably about the most honest answer. Well, it all answer, depends what Bob? you want to say. But they, uh, the bottom line is there's still a piece of it missing, and I think that's about all that I'm going to say. But uh, you can imagine people saying, well, if you had that, there's the proof. You bring it out. You show it to the world. There's yeah. the proof that you're telling the truth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and did that ever occur to you to do that? But if he well, brought it out, would that mean that it was the fuel for flying saucers that were brought here by aliens that make a disc capable of interstellar travel? Or would it just be a unique piece of really heavy metal? Well, uh, you know, yeah, I, we I guess. we thought about all this stuff 20 years ago. <laughs> You know, well, it's... that was part. Part of it was, you know, certainly we had to do. Uh, we wanted to do some of the testing ourselves, and you know, release uh, knowledge that we had a piece of it. And you know, where do you send it? How can you hear about all kinds of things like this just disappearing? And you know, what would you do with a piece of Element One Fifteen? Who would you, you get arrested for espionage if you're caught with it? <laughs> yeah. So we didn't really get a chance to do much with it because it was shortly after we had it that it was removed from our possession. You know, the uh, technology you described, uh, they were working on it 20 years ago. They made some progress, not enough for you, which is one of the reasons you said you came forward with this information. But uh, do you imagine that they have perfected it now to the point where they can use it in a practical way? No, I don't think so. It. It is never going to move forward fast enough, and it was you know, very aggravating back then. When something is, is run strictly by the military or whatever faction of the government controls it, uh, you don't have that scientific, that open, free discussion, that exchange of ideas. And if they would have employed that from the beginning, uh, we would have really made leaps and bounds. But if you keep everything in just a small, tight-knit group of, you know, under two dozen people, you're, you're, the progress you're going to make is so slow. It's so frustrating. The system we had there that I, I told you about, the buddy system, where it's just you work in groups of two. You can only communicate with the person, your buddy, the person you're set up with. And there's really minimal crosstalk between the different topics and different groups, and it, it's so stifling. Even today, it pisses me off to, to think about it, just the, the technology, the wonders you have at, at your fingertips there. You just can't keep this <laughs> quiet the way it is. You must release this out to the scientific community. And it, I know it has all kinds of weapon potential. I know it has... I'm sure there's a hundred different reasons why they're not they're not releasing it, none of which I think are that valid. But, you know, certainly expand the amount of people that you're exposing this information to if you want to get anywhere with it, because it, it, it it's really unlimited power. And maybe that's maybe that's the, the main reason. George, it's, here's uh, a quote uh, from uh, Ben Rich. Again, he was the former head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, you know, the SR-71, the uh, stealth bomber, the stealth fighter. This was the head man of all the black projects that everyone, you know, always accuses the government of hiding out of Area 51. Back in the early 90s, he said this. This is a quote. We already have the means to travel among the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black projects, and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity. Anything you can imagine, we already know how to do. 
that's a direct quote of Ben Rich. Well, so. I'd have to agree with that. Well, uh, you know, you look you look back on that period and what they could have done with that technology and, and the description you gave, Bob, of the small teams and the lack of expertise, that, that leads to one of the criticisms of your story is that they say, yeah, you're a smart guy and you may know this and that about electronics and physics, but you're not a Ph.D. You're not the uh, uh, cream of the crop uh, right. back then. And I, I mean no I disrespect. I agree with it 100%. So again, why would they bring something- you into it? You know, why would they bring you into that program? This is my question. You can't answer my questions with the same question. That's the first thing I mentioned to you, if you recall. You know, it it makes no sense. Why are they picking me for this job? Certainly, this isn't my specialty. I mean, there must be some other qualities they're looking at. Um, Who knows what they are? But, no, of course, there are people that thousand times more knowledgeable on this and maybe it's just not outright knowledge they're looking for maybe they're looking for someone and you know come out of left field with some new fresh ideas because they weren't making any progress anywhere but yeah this is this is the exact thing that i put out there but george bob is a comprehensive problem solver and he's exhibited that in his previous jobs he was a widower at the time he was hired uh a lot of reasons to use a guy like that. I mean, can you take the uh, head of the physics department at MIT who has a wife and kids and a job and goes to work every day and suddenly remove him and fly him out to Nevada and fly him out to the Area 51 and back to Las Vegas every day and keep that quiet? I mean, if you took all the top minds from all the universities, would they stay quiet? I mean, they'd be noticed as being missing. They'd be noticed as as being removed from their normal life. I think they have to take guys like Bob. Uh, they're the only ones who, who aren't missed in their day-to-day life. Well, it feeds into the scenario that's been discussed many times over the years that this is all disinformation. Uh, you know, it's occurred to me that, Bob, they may have chosen you because you're a savvy guy and a smart guy and you might have contributed something to the program, but also uh, because they may have figured you might have talked about it or they figure if you did talk about it that you, you would be easily... Uh, dismissed or, um, you know, character assassination, whatever, which is a lot of what happened. Well, yeah, that's true. Like I've always said, I'm an easy guy to, (laughs) or or certainly a candidate for character assassination. But it's possible that was true of everybody else at S4, too. We don't know. I mean, clearly the, the, the lead guys from Caltech, the lead guys from MIT, the lead guys from everywhere are not working at S4. You know, yeah, so how do we know what the credentials or what the situation was of the other people that worked there? Uh, maybe that is part of the the idea there. It's just to keep a lower profile. But you know, if in fact that's it, uh, that that has some terrible effects on the program. That- well, they they run the story. They they release it to a gullible reporter like me. I I bite on it, and uh, they. They sort of run it up the flagpole and then discredit you, and uh, they're just sort of gauging public reaction to what would happen if uh, if they released this, which is why a lot of people say, ah, it's all disinformation. They're trying to deflect attention from something else out there. John, you're, this is sort of your area of expertise. What do, what do you think about that scenario? Well, let's see. The, uh, the bell jar experiment, that'll settle everything. Meaning uh, the videotape. The videotape. But, I mean, the idea of uh, disinformation, they, you, you've been characterized as sort of the Svengali of this whole thing. You must have set it up, talked Bob and Gene into going along with the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, explain the because laughter. We're so easy guys to talk into things, aren't we, John? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I mean, explain that for the sake of the listeners, though, how, why that's funny. Well, I mean, John, you know, John and Bob have been arguing at odds about a million different points over the years. The, uh, <laughs> you know, John, John didn't even know Bob until I took him over there and introduced him one day. I mean, they, they, John was already on your uh, local interview show here on the record, telling us all about Richard Nixon and Jackie Gleason and all of the stuff, you know, before Bob, uh, Bob Lazar was around. That John was out there on a limb. I mean, did, John used Bob the back back him up it wasn't the other way around it's, wait, are people implying that 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 i guess i missed the point here that like john and i fabricated this this story for is, is that 
Yeah, that's come up once or twice over the years. Oh, is that uh, what you're talking about now? Yeah, but the larger disinfo scenario is that uh, that maybe you were duped, that you were shown this stuff, that they created this whole thing, that they wanted you to spill the beans and it's sort of a psychological operation or maybe to divert attention. I mean, you've heard that scenario Diverted, discussed. Well, wait, divert attention from what? Yeah. So, yeah, that's I mean, I, I was given this material and free reign to analyze it, tinker with it. And so exactly what, and I certainly convinced myself I knew what I was dealing with. So what could be more shocking than that? Now, what dastardly thing are they hiding that they decided to put a giant UFO story out there for? And, how, and again, they, they, they gave him this ammo, they implanted this story in his head with mind control, and then what did they throw up in the air on the Wednesday night when he took us out there to see the, <laughs> yeah, the it's, test? Yeah, that, that, that about, scenario becomes completely ridiculous when you look how about at all when the, they how took the events him, took place. When they took him down to the St. Louis substation and registered his guns when he was in the program, when the Russians were in town running around trying to bribe people, what about <laughs> there are other comical stories that never really hit the mainstream. And, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, but weren't you supposed to actually, like, give a little seminar seminar to some other guys out at E&G&G or something, and you overslept and didn't go give the class? Oh, yeah. Boy, <laughs> that was a disaster. But, yeah, there's, you know, in a, in a radio show, it's impossible to cover all of the little fine points of, you know, of what happened, why, you know, claims of, uh, along those lines are just are beyond ridiculous. It, well, um, how about the I OF asked him at the time yeah. when we first, when I was first shown some of the ET material, and you know, certain seeing the the breadth, the size of the base, and the amount of equipment they had, and how do you guys keep this secret? And that's the first thing they told me, uh, which I've mentioned before. I said it's the easiest thing in the world to keep secret. It's nothing like any of our other black projects because nobody believes this stuff is true. It's a piece of cake, and and it is true. People have a built-in of prejudice, essentially, that, you know, flying saucers, aliens, this is all the stuff of science fiction. And, you know, for the most part, that's just the way people believe. It's It's very difficult. That's how I was in the program. I mean, to me, this was all silliness. Everything I heard from John Lear and, you know, these reports on TV of people being abducted, and I, this was total silliness to me, although I still have a problem with a lot of it. I'm probably the biggest UFO skeptic there is, but when it comes down to, you know, are there actual ET craft here on Earth, it, it really is true. Well, I, the, the explanation I give about the disinformation scenario is if uh, if they were, in fact, trying to divert attention from something else going out there, some legitimate national security program, and they just wanted to mess with people's minds, it had to backfire on them because the result of your story, the UFO story at S4, I mean, tens of thousands of people trekked out there. Every news organization in the world has been there. Congressional investigators have been there. They got a lot more scrutiny than I think they ever wanted, no matter what it is that they're working on out there. Well, they had bus tours out there, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. for a while. It's, uh, but, but, it's like I said, that those scenarios don't make any sense at all. So it, it couldn't. I mean, that's, that's, that's not even a reasonable, a reasonable guess. But, George, look at the people that have come forward to you that, that you've never even gone public with, people that have told you things that they don't want released until after their death. What about this uh, uh, Boyd Bushman? What about Edgar Mitchell? What about, you know, there are other people who have, you know, you know well, Edgar Mitchell at least had a conversation in person with Bob Lazar, but this Boyd Bushman, he has no idea. He, he's never spoken to Bob Lazar. There are people coming out confirming this stuff. Now, if this was all a mind control game and a disinformation act played on Bob Lazar, why is why are why are the uh, you know former senior uh, uh, engineers from uh, the Lockheed Skunk Works and and astronauts and all these people coming forward saying they've seen evidence of their satisfaction that this is real? If all this was just a, a hoax on Bob Lazar, what are all these guys big dummies that just believe Bob Lazar? They they've seen corroborating evidence elsewhere from other than Bob Lazar. One other topic I want to touch on before we uh, go to the break and then open up the phone lines is polygraph tests. This has come up again 
Uh, there's a character online who writes about it uh, based on things he's, I don't know, uh, he got, uh, he channeled information or something. He knows the truth about it and he writes about uh, all the polygraph tests and you flunked all of them. Uh, you want to walk through this uh, scenario? Uh, I know that it took a took a while to convince you to go ahead and get these tests. Wait, we did wait. The f- Somebody said I flunked them? Yeah. There, there's a guy but ca- you came out. Never there. You one. know I, that's not true. <laughs> yeah, I know it's not true. And I've told the guys uh, in this uh, this particular chat group it's not true and went through the scenario. And it doesn't matter. People who were not there at the test didn't see the results, didn't talk to the polygraph examiners are sure that you flunked them. Well, of course, people can make up what they want, but, you know, we're trying to deal with reality here. The, um, I, I don't remember the guy's name. The, the only time there was inconclusive results was the initial polygraph, the guy who said, you're going to be my ticket to, oh, to the Geraldo show or something like that. And uh, I think he was more concerned about becoming a star from this than doing a polygraph test when... And you, you even arranged one of those. for and, and paid for these uh, polygraph tests. And you got, um, what was that guy's name, that ex-cop? Terry yeah, the, fir- the, the first guy, was his name was Ron Slay. And, That's uh, right. Ron it was a pretty Slay. perfunctory test, but uh, it, actually he uh, had said that the results were inconclusive. He ran it twice. Right. He thought you might have been deceptive in the first one, but he said afterward in an interview that you were really scared and that seemed to affect the test results. The second guy, and he recommended we do a second one, uh, his name was Terry Tavernetti, a former police officer who is now uh, still a uh, corporate security officer with a major gaming corporation. He performs polygraphs as part of his his uh, job every day, and he said in unequivocal terms that you passed. And he, he broke the test up into four areas. Uh, he put you through it twice, and you passed. Uh, right. W- no question about it. But then it was then some of... Terry Tavernetti's, uh, I think, associate, so, someone else took a look at it, and their opinion was that they saw a couple of areas that they thought were they might have been inconclusive. But inconclusive was the worst that ever happened. He never failed a polygraph at all. Yeah, that's true. So, well, I mean, uh, how could somebody come out of left field at not not being there, not knowing these guys, not, and saying and come up with statements like that? This is the craziness that. I get exposed to all the time. People uh, uh, hear portions of the story and weave together uh, the remaining uh, remainder, and it, it it turns into the most ridiculous story. Something uh, that I'm not even familiar with. But um, yeah, it's guys like this, these UFO I, nuts. That it's why I try and distance myself from this topic completely. George, should polygraphs be subjective? I mean. I mean, can two people read a polygraph differently? Well, I guess slight uh, nuances, but uh, Terry Tavernetti said you passed. He gave it to a second polygrapher who agreed with that estimation. He gave it to a third who agreed but said, well, maybe you're you're telling stuff that you heard from somebody else and he'd like to see another test. But nobody said that you flunked. Of all the people that looked at it, nobody said you flunked. Um, We got a couple – I thought the first guy, the Ron Slay, I thought Bob had passed one and one was inconclusive. I didn't right, realize. Right, that's what George said, yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember. I thought he, it was, uh, you know, it doesn't matter at this point. Yeah. It, it, the oh, overall it. result was inconclusive. I, well, we've got a couple of minutes left before the break and we open up the phone lines. Bob, uh, I guess uh, safe to say that you would not do the same, you would not play it the same way? No. Boy, uh, you know, a lot of times gone by, and like I said, I... I really feel privileged and uh, to have been part of the project, and uh, obviously it fascinates me. Uh, you know, somebody this deep into science, where it's you know part of my life to be on beyond the cutting edge is uh, really something. And uh, but the way this all went down and the, the way it was digested by uh, you know the people in general, I don't think I would ever say anything again. And uh, you know, because of the effects on your personal life. Yeah, because of the effects on my personal life. And, and just it was really eye-opening the way, you know, people receive information like this and, the, you know, uh, <laughs> how hostile they'll be because they just don't want to believe something. And, um, you know, and of the tremendous amount of disinformation and, 
you know, attacks associated with it. You know, why in the world would I ever do that again? All right. We have another hour left with Bob Lazar, Gene Huff, John Lear. Uh, Stay with us. We'll be opening up the phone lines here on Coast to Coast AM. Celebrating sort of the, or marking the 20th anniversary of the Bob Lazar story, Area 51, S4, Flying Saucers in Government Hangars. Uh, Also joined by John Lear and Gene Huff. I know a lot of you have questions for this trio, and we'll get right to the phone as soon as we come back on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. We're in the final hour with Bob Lazar, Gene Huff, John Lear. Uh, we're opening the phones in just a moment, Bob. Uh, you had said earlier there are a lot of uh, Lazar imposters out there on websites and Facebook and things of that sort. A couple of the listeners had written in saying they, they were curious about a site they found that had artwork and uh, drawings and things of that sort, uh, uh, whether that you were related to that in any way. No. Is that Could that be John Ferret's uh, old site? Uh, well, that's BobLazar.com. Now that, yeah, I'm not talking about that site. That's John Ferrat, uh, a friend of mine, and he essentially put all the, I, I don't know what the status is, but he put uh, n- essentially the bulk of my story online and uh, drew all the graphics concerning uh, the reactor technical aspects. Uh, measurements, that sort of thing, everything that I knew at the time. Now, that's uh, yeah, a separate website that I wasn't involved in but certainly knew about. Um, these other ones I'm talking about, the social network groups, you know, the MySpace, Facebook, that type of thing, none of those have anything to do with me. Okay, going to the phones, east of the Rockies. George. Fred. Yeah. Hello? Uh, east of the Rockies, Fred in Florida, are you there? Fred. Okay. How about Florida. west of the Rockies? What were you going to say? I was going to say that it's important to clarify that what they just heard is that Bob Lazar isn't even involved with BobLazar.com, much less <laughs> the other website. So that was pretty interesting <laughs> right. statement, actually. Okay, go ahead. West of the Rockies, uh, 007 and a half in Southern Cal. Are you there? Well, hello, everybody. Hi How there. you doing? I'm doing better than ever. This is my birthday, 55 today. Happy birthday. Well, thanks. I wanted to tell a true story. In 2001, I was up in the mountain above Palm Springs. They call it Idlewild up there. And one night I was sitting out, couldn't sleep. I was sitting out on a chair in front of my house up there. And a lot of cloud and fog moved in fast and mysteriously that night. And something made me look up at the exact second this big old perfectly round flying saucer came in and with the lights turned off. I could uh, see it plainly because it came in low enough. And they turned the lights on when they went over my head and it pulsated white light. It looked like a wheel going around it inside of it, around the edge of it, probably the propulsion system. I don't know if that would have been magnetic rail thing or whatever it was, it's got to be a lot more advanced than what they got in Area 51. I don't know how much back engineering they've done over there, but anyway, after they went over my head, they turned the lights off, and I heard it land. And a little bit later, all the lights in Idlewild blinked on and off a couple of times. And a little bit later, this strange lady, says her name was Tomorrow, comes down the road, gets a cigarette from me, and as she's leaving, turns and says, I'll see you tomorrow. Now, uh, from what I've learned from the people from the ship since then, uh, I think they're in the process of doing a roundup to take a load up to their planet. But who's to say this whole planet isn't uh, nothing more than uh, space aliens living on this planet that they originally seeded? Uh, Who's to say that isn't true, you know, which it might be? Uh, So the question is, could that possibly be true? And uh, and basically, message is uh, if you if you can do good consistently instead of doing bad, then you're a candidate for rescue. I'd like to know everybody's thoughts on all this, and thanks a lot. I'll hang up now. John? Okay. John, you want to tackle that one? Is John awake? Is it, am I still awake? <laughs> sorry, sorry, John. It's pretty late for you. Did uh, did you hear that uh, that question? 
Yeah, just give me the the um, uh, the base of what it was. <laughs> well, I think he uh, he saw a, a UFO incident and uh, had an encounter with somebody who was a strange lady, and his suggestion was maybe we were uh, we're seated here that aliens seated the the planet. Yes, that's possible. And the way you get out of here is uh, is uh, to exercise integrity without envy and without greed. So okay. Uh, maybe I'll bring it back to you, Bob, uh, <laughs> and all the material that, that you read uh, leading up to your introduction to the program. Did you see anything about uh, intent of the visitors or what they want? I mean, it's my intent of, as the visitors or what they want. I don't think it was ever made clear what their intent was. Um, you know, is there information that I saw that, that you know, might imply that uh, they had something to do with putting people here? Well, possibly. I mean, that's my personal belief. I think in, yeah, to some extent, people were seated in, uh, you know, if you want to call it that, uh, by another civilization. But, um, you know, it's... Meaning genetically altered, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you read something about genetic alterations that took place throughout human history, right? Right. So, I don't know. Is that seeding? I guess in some respect it is. But, um, well, the, you know. The, they were doing us the favor, more or less. Wasn't that your perspective? I mean, there was more in it for us than for them, apparently. That's certainly true. Uh, wild card line, Ed in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Good morning, Ed. Good morning, George. Fantastic show, as per usual. Uh, and happy anniversary, 20 years. I <laughs> am very much a fan of Bob Lazar and John and Gene's work. And I wish that you guys would make the first show available on Coast to Coast, like the interview show that you did on TV, as well as Art's first show. I think it was in 1990, I believe, that Bob Lazar was interviewed on Coast to Coast. Well, that was a long have, time ago. I I can't believe it's been 20 years myself. Yeah, it's bizarre. Uh, I have a question, a couple questions, and a brief comment. And, oh, my God, where to start? Uh, it's quite a privilege and a pleasure to speak to you, Bob. Well, thank um, you. Um, good luck with your new endeavor with the uh, car inserts or whatever, the hydrogen. The hydrogen, yes. Well, yeah, thanks my, again my, for that. My, my mom worked for Air Products for 30 years, and my dad, at each picnic, would talk to the president of Air Products and say that he had plans for a hydrogen car when he was fighting in World War II in Brazil. Really? Uh, with the American soldiers, yeah. And he would tell the president of Air Products every summer at the company picnic, why don't you build a hydrogen car? You wouldn't have to import any more oil. And, you know, and they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, like, last year they announced that Air Products is now trying to make their version of a hydrogen car. Oh, no kidding. Now, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, Air Products, one of the biggest suppliers of gases, industrial gases in the world, and for NASA. Anyway, um, the other question is, when are you going to make your autobiography? And if so, you could possibly fund even more hydrogen car works. And the other question is, uh, would, if you were offered to work again, for uh, Los Alamos and or uh, somewhere in Area 51, like if they called you up and said, okay, we're sorry, we want you back, <laughs> would you go? And I have another comment, if I could, please, okay. after that question. Well, the comment is a joke. It was 20 years ago that Joan Rivers said in one of her concerts that she's in her comedy concerts, she said, you know why a UFO never lands in a Jewish lawn? <laughs> you know, poking fun at herself and wow. my, my own religion. She said, because they would turn it over to see who manufactured it, see if they can get in on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Like kind of the truth, because they always want to build stuff. And, and my family, indeed, was involved in manufacturing for years. And it's like a triple entendre joke. But uh -huh. anyway, that's, that's my questions. And good luck. God be with you and all of you. And more power to us all. And hopefully the, the future will be one of peace and no oil. And lots of hydrogen cars everywhere, not polluting the earth. I'm all for and, that. Thanks, Ed. And, uh, 
So, Bob, uh, the central question there I, is pretty interesting. Would you work for them again? They said, hey, all is forgiven. Come back to us for we need your help on these saucers. You know, you won't believe how often I think about this. Um, <clears throat> and that, that's, a, that's really a tough question because, first of all, I'd apologize to them because they were right. Just keep your mouth closed, you know, and that, that's the only way – to stay here is to go with the flow and you know i am so sorry i made that move but getting back to the question uh yeah unfortunately my life has gotten a lot more complicated i mean i have several businesses and all that and move you know and wife in michigan however if we can put all that stuff on hold or if i was just single again without attachments to other businesses and all that would i go back yeah in a heartbeat i really would bob i need to ask a, a question you what, you spoke before about uh one of the problems with hydrogen cars is detecting the leakage because there's no odorants involved with the hydrogen and of course as you know they they pretty much proved that the reason the hindenburg lit up like it did was because of the aluminum doping on the skin right, and not, not the, the hydrogen, hydrogen itself how explosive is hydrogen? You said, well, if a, a cubic foot of hydrogen leaked out, or, I mean, does it catch on fire that easily? Well, how, how dangerous is it? How explosive is hydrogen? Well, a, a cubic foot isn't really that, that dangerous. It burned in air, and, it, you know, it, it does have a wide range of flammability. But, um, but it's got you know, when it, it, right? the, the, more, the, more, the real problem here is, is overcoming the, the stigma of hydrogen. When you mention hydrogen to people, they're only going to think of two things, the Hindenburg or a hydrogen, you know, thermonuclear bomb. bomb. And both of them are bad news. So it, it's tough overcoming that. The actual dangers are are very minimal, and a gasoline car by far is, is, is the bomb that you're driving, not a hydrogen car. I want to go back to sort of the implication of Ed's question there and, and your interesting answer that you would actually think about uh, going back and wish you had stayed in the program. Could you imagine or have you thought it out about where it would be now, what your role would be if you'd stayed in it, how far the research would have progressed? Well, if things would have gone a lot smoother and, and I, you know, we wouldn't have had the security problems that popped up and, you know, if things remained under control, um, is it possible that we would have made more progress? I, I don't know. Who knows how many people before me uh, tried to make the identical progress that I was trying to do. I focused on uh, what I was primarily interested in and, you know, what our group was directed to do. But I certainly don't see... Uh, why I would have made <clears throat> a giant difference. I, you know, I, basically what I'm saying, at, in this amount of time, we'd probably be about the same place they are now. I don't, I don't think I had any special abilities or, you know, uh, or any, uh, <laughs> I can't think of the word to say, but... Um, well, you know what? We're just guessing. I mean, maybe they made a breakthrough. Maybe that uh, statement out of... Uh... The guy from Lockheed is uh, more telling than we know that they have figured it out by now. It's possible, but I have no reason to think that I could have been a uh, major contributor, you know, any more than any other person there. So uh, that's hard to say. But then well, ben, ben Rich says, you know, who used to run the Lockheed Skunk Org, says that it's locked up in Black Project and it would take an act of God for it to ever be used for any public purpose. So what there's a, that indicates to me they're probably talking about they're going to keep it for weapons and military, you know, defense or offense purposes, whatever, but it, it's never going to, you know, be disclosed and given to the public for any benefit. It's a crime, but I'm, if they're not going to let the people know about it, I sure want to know. <laughs> you know, I, mean, yeah. I just uh, have a craving to you know, to get back into where I was. And I know that's impossible, but I do think about it all the time. It's kind of like, uh, you know, that, that annoying feeling you have. What if? Yeah, exactly. It's a what if that never goes away. And I really don't know how to describe it, but it bothers me a lot because there are times I said, well, no, I'd never go back. This is ridiculous. And 
But really, as time goes on, and now I'm, I'm over 50, uh, you know, you start thinking different. And, boy, I if things were as they were back then, I would jump right back into it. Do you Nowadays, think, with the, like I said, the way my life is, it'd be impossible. Do you it, think so. um, if, if you had stayed quiet and not gone public, uh, you, know, at, you know, they yanked your clearance and you were temporarily out of the program, if you had just shut up, and well, that had to do with told, Tracy, not with me. Right, but I'm just saying, if you had done as you were told and stayed quiet and not gone public, do you think they would have rehired you? Would they have called you back after a layoff? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Good we're going to go to Blair in Sedona, Arizona, on the wild card line. Good morning, Blair. Thank you, George. Hey, Mr. Lazar, speaking of gravity uh, propulsion, George had a gentleman by the name of Channon on his October 25th show who said frequency patterns hold the planets in place, not gravity. And, frequency uh, was, patterns of what? Hmm. Well, there you go. I guess you've got to define exactly what he means there. That's I mean, maybe general. it's the frequency patterns of a gravitational wave. Ah. But, I mean, you have to, yeah, have to be a frequency of some energy, and maybe that's, you know, what he was referring to, that it's not, it, it's not a static wave, that it's an active, and, and he would be right. It's, uh, you know, if he's talking about frequency of gravitational waves, I guess that's just a correct statement. Would you be able to speculate on a post-government disclosure society and what specifically and how will the current suppressed technologies of unlimited power enhance American life, those leaps and bounds you were talking about? So the effects of letting it all out. Yeah. Well, and how would that change our lives directly? I, a lot of that would depend on exactly how far they were able to take this, because if they can't, if they really can't duplicate it, then it's useless to everybody. And if it just remains that the craft or components of other crafts they have are the only working pieces of that technology, and it can't be made to work with Earth technology, it's there's no use at all. It just is a novelty. However, if they were able to surpass that and, and able to duplicate some of the technology, some of the ideas, or even you know, some of the basic concepts uh, using Earth materials, sure, there could be, it, it could be a, a world-changing event. There could be sources of energy that are limitless. But, again, using, you know, using alien materials requires a, sor a source for those alien materials. And I don't know of any Earth materials that could be substituted or that perform like the ones we were looking at. So I, I don't see where, where the project really would have proceeded. But, um, you know, I didn't know everything about it. I just knew the uh, small amount of information that they dealt out to my group and i'm sure i don't have anything close to a big picture so it's you'd have to think hard. that if they if they had the stuff they spent all these years trying to figure it out and they they were just stumped that they'd just bury it somewhere they, they wouldn't talk about it they wouldn't let it out they wouldn't want any of our adversaries to know about its potential oh, they'd uh, because somebody else <laughs> they'd never do that. They, I mean, they'd tinker with it forever. They'd never just bury it and throw it away because just, just on the, you know, outside hope that you know a new young upstart comes in somewhere, has some neat idea, and now finally they have access to all this power and technology. They're never going to throw it on the back shelf. It's too, it's their prized possession. You know, they're they're never just going to throw it in a box and do you know one of the Raiders of the Lost Ark thing and some giant. <laughs> You Not know. to mention that those who brought it here were supposed to come back another time, so they would probably at least keep it and hope that happened. Gentlemen, we're taking another break. We'll come back with our guests, Bob Lazar, Gene Huff, and John Lear. If he's still with us there, uh, stay with us. We'll go to more of your calls after these breaks and messages on Coast to Coast AM. We uh, are joined tonight by a couple of UFO maniacs, Bob Lazar, Gene Huff, John Lear, talking about Area 51, and in, in a way, it's a story that launched a thousand businesses uh posters and ashtrays and t-shirts and uh, even bob lazar christmas ornaments uh, books uh, tours video games 
uh, bars named Area 51, bands named Area 51. There's a there's a band named Element 115, uh, in case uh, Bob Lazar has never heard of that one. A lot of people have made a lot of money on the story, uh, uh, Bob Lazar and Gene Huff and John Lear not being among them. Uh, however, uh, a lot of interest continues. When we come back, we'll go back to the phones, get to as many of your questions as we can here on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. We're in the home stretch with uh, Bob Lazar, John Lear, Gene Huff, going to east of the Rockies, Glenn in Texas. Good morning, Glenn. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I'd just like to say this is a, a, a wonderful experience, and uh, what a forum art created. Uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Lazar, and if I may, a uh, quick question for uh, Mr. Lear. Go for it. Uh, Mr. Lazar, uh, did the uh, craft at S-4 have any landing gear, and if so, uh, what kind of configuration? It may help with the speculation on the specific use or general use. And uh, Mr. Lear? Yeah. Uh, I grew up uh, here in uh, Harlingen, Texas with the CAF. And uh, is the ride in a souped up A26 uh, a body numbing experience or something even so you just don't want to get out of? Thank you, and I'll listen on the air. John, why don't you start first? Okay, what was his question? He was talking about a ride in an A26 if it was a body numbing experience. Oh, uh, I don't know. I had a lot of time in the airplane, but it was not a body-numbing experience. So you're not a big fan of that plane? Oh, yeah, it's a great airplane. Yeah, I loved it. Uh, you know, in 1968, I was the first guy ever to, to fly in the Reno Air Races and actually placed fifth. I had a one B-51 a, a in the uh, B-26 Okay. I was five. When John was in that race, George, we were five. <laughs> Bob, you're part of that question. Uh, did the craft have any landing gear? No, not that I was aware of. Anytime I saw the craft, it was on its belly or lifted off the ground, but I didn't see any landing gear, and I did get to look in the lower portion of the craft. The only thing that's down there are the gravity emitters, uh, you know, the amplifiers, if you will. Uh, there's no room anywhere for any kind of uh, landing gear, so I imagine they're always counting on the craft uh, lifting itself off the ground and, or sitting on its belly, but there's nothing that stands it off the ground. Bob, was, the, was there um, the, 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 I don't know what I'm trying to... It, the bottom of the craft, where the when it would turn up on its side and they'd focus the gravity amplifiers on a point, did you were you taught? Did you sense? Did you know? Is the bottom of that open? Does something open? Is it made of something else, or is it all all the same continuous? Uh, no, the bottom, the, the very the bottom of it's flat under the amplifiers there. But, but it's no, solid? it's not. It's not open. Yeah, it's solid. Okay, but same same as the rest of the skin of the craft. Do, uh, I, I don't know. It appeared the same, but okay. if the material was different, I, All right. I wouldn't know. Uh, uh, keeping with Glenn's question, when they're in the hangars, these things, you saw nine different craft in the hangars. Were they suspended, uh, like ropes or uh, no, uh, cables sitting, or something? sitting on their belly with the exception of the one that was tilted up that had a uh, hole in it that I you know, mentioned looks like a projectile had been fired through it. Okay. West of the Rockies, Mark in San Diego. Good morning, uh, Mark. Hi. Uh, by the way, my favorite three guests. I'd like to ask each of them uh, how this has affected them on a religious level, like if they were raised a Catholic, and has this have any effect on their religious beliefs, as in like afterlife or a supreme being? Gene, why don't we start with you on that? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the difference between Bob and I is that he is interested in the technology and the hardware and of course, you know, he, he, from what I've heard him say on this show tonight, he's changing now that he's over 50. But my, the impetus for me and the whole thing were the basic questions of man. Uh, who are we? Where did we come from? Where are we going to? Life after death, God. The things that none of us are exempt from. And if these gray aliens or whomever brought these craft here had any commentary on any of that, I would like to know what they had to say. So, yeah, I've, I've, it's uh, 
I've given a great deal of thought to that, and Bob did not used to think about it at all. I don't know if he does now or not, but it completely changed my life. By the way, uh, Edgar Mitchell, as the astronaut also, uh, he said that when he was on the moon looking back at the Earth, it was tough to see where heaven was, and it kind of changed him philosophically also. It was a it was a life-changing experience standing on the surface of the moon and looking back at the Earth. So I guess all of us have different times in our life that make us examine our mortality and and uh, try and grasp whatever we can to get answers. But, yeah, the material Bob brought forward was uh, certainly changed my life and, and, and changed me a lot philosophically. And, Bob, do you think of it in a spiritual or philosophical way? Any differences? No, I mean, I'm not the most spiritual person you'll I'm not either. Into. Um, <laughs> you know, I really, uh, if anything, I'm anti-religion. I think organized religion is. Uh, probably the worst thing that's ever happened to civilization. But <laughs> uh, sorry, that's the way I believe. It creates all the wars, and I, I don't even want to get into it. But you can be spiritual and you know not be involved in mainstream religion. You know, it, it, is there a god? You know, who knows the answer to these questions? But um, you know, did it did it affect me? No, because I really didn't have any religious beliefs. Uh, you know, I believe there is some order to the universe. I, I don't think when you die, that's it. Although, you know, science-wise, it tells me that, you know, that uh, that's all that happens is life and death. And But, um, you know, you just have those other feelings inside you that have no, <laughs> no basis or, or facts to follow. But um, I really wasn't religious before that. And after being exposed to it, uh, it really didn't change anything or my belief. In hey, John, John Lear, uh, it did, uh, you know, not only the Area 51 revelations, but the larger UFO picture changed your philosophy of life or changed the way you look at uh, the universe or e- eternity after that? Changed everything, because now I know exactly what's going on and how it works. <laughs> wow. So you're going to write another? Uh, you, you're going to write a religious text and, and, and let us all know? Probably not. It's uh, there are very few that that uh, that really know this, or that would understand it, or that would care. And are you optimistic in general? Oh yeah! Wow. Well, that, that's that's something. First time caller, PJ, Santa Maria, California. Hi, PJ. Hey, good morning, guys. It is a pleasure talking to you, all of you guys. And the uh, question is for John Lear this morning. And, John, I'm curious with the uh, lunar water findings as of the last couple of days, and I understand I'm having followed all three of you guys there uh, for the last decade or so and, you know, researching on what you've talked about with uh, structures on the moon and obviously a lot of features that uh, would have to be uh, man-made or made somewhere on there. What do you think with uh, what NASA is doing? Do you think they're slowly starting to disseminate information about things up there? Do you, is, it, is it a new finding to them that there is water there, or do you think they knew this from, from a long time ago? They probably knew there was some long time ago because they had a lot of pictures on, the, uh, on both the near side and far side. There's cities, waters, lakes rivers, uh, anything you want. The other day we managed to catch a spectacular picture where uh, the holograph of Endymion, which is a crater at the top of the moon about 1 o'clock, somehow the holograph or whatever hides it uh, went away for just a few minutes, and a friend of mine had a telescope aimed right at it and was able to uh, to draw what is really at Endymion. It was uh, it was a fascinating experience, and he came to uh, Las Vegas, and we went over it, and uh, we drew it many many times until we got it exactly right. What was there? It was a city with uh, with buildings and towers, and uh, uh, and it's hidden by uh, holographic nature. Boy, that sounds so crazy to me. I can't even <laughs> relate to you. John is back. Yeah. <laughs> so much for the saying, John. No, I, we're we're poking fun, John. But uh, you're saying that there's all this stuff up there that's covered by holographic uh, technology of some sort. Oh yeah, the whole. The whole darn place is covered. Just to keep it secret from us? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much to keep it secret from us. We're going to go to the uh, wild card line, Chez, in New York City. Good morning, Chez. Hi, George. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you, and, and I'm an avid follower of you and all your guests. And Thanks. I, I had a couple of questions for Bob. Um, Bob, I was wondering, I know it's been a while, but I, I was wondering if you could speak to any sort of uh, description or detail as it relates to the skin of any of these crafts. Uh, that was my first question. My second question was, uh, is there anything of s- sort of an innocuous nature, something odd or bizarre that you could remember about any sort of compartments or uh, maybe uh, – support facilities for some of these occupants or pilots of the craft? I didn't have any knowledge of anything along those lines um, as far as the you know, occupants of the craft or um, you know, anything to do with biology. The, well, he's he, talking about compartments inside the craft. I mean, you did get a look inside there, right? The oh, furniture? Compartments inside. Yeah, maybe I misunderstood the question. Right. Um, yeah, compartments inside the craft. I did get to inspect uh, everything in the craft with the exception of the very upper level, which I believe was just uh, navigation and their version of electronics. Um, but it didn't look like there was anything but open space. Uh, there were three seats for the occupants of the craft, uh, but there were no individual Oh, rooms, compartments, or or what have you, like we we might have on one of our, uh, you know, any form of transportation. There's nothing like a, a bathroom or a smaller area. Everything is just each level is completely open in itself. So I wouldn't call anything a compartment anywhere. The other part of that question he asked about was the skin. Uh, did it have skin or is it just metallic? Well, it's I called it metal, and again, uh, each. Each part of uh, the research done is, uh, you know, as it gets late, my brain begins to run, <laughs> run out of words. But, um, uh, you know, it's all very compartmentalized, and the people that dealt with the metallurgy were a, a completely different group of people. I had no knowledge of it. The uh, only light I can shine on it is the one time I walked across the craft and just slid my hand along it. It was cold, and that's the only reason I said it, it felt like metal. Um, it was, you know, cooler than the ambient air. Uh, could it have been some exotic ceramic or something? Uh, probably so. I'm sure it wasn't just an alloy of aluminum or anything along those lines. But um, that, that's about all I know about it. It was uh, a pewter gray in color, as was everything on the inside and outside of the craft. So that's that's about all I can say as far as what the material was. Chaz, thanks for the call. We're going to go to Jim in Chicago. Good morning, Jim. Yeah, George. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I got a problem with my phone here. Anyway, I like your style because I'm also a bottom line guy. I have a question for Mr. Lazar. I want to know about the alien bodies. Has he seen them? And in his opinion, are they biological? Are they semi-biological or perhaps interdimensional? I haven't personally seen an alien. I I did see a photograph of a creature. Uh, was that creature in the craft or you know a pilot of the craft? I you know I was just given some information, a brief overview of other other portions of research being done. But again, I had no direct information about any of the biological aspects of... Well, you saw it vivisectioned and weighed. Yeah, but like I said, this is... I was given briefings that, well, as you know, portions of reports on many of the other areas, but I had no specific information on how that creature that I saw, or the images of the creature, if that had anything, in fact, to do with the craft. You see what I'm saying? But you did the the pictures that you did see the vivisection or autopsy like photos showed organs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a central organ as opposed to, uh, and I think that's what the comments were underneath it. That uh, from their estimation, it's 
I think I gave the description as if it, it, of if you uh, had taken all our organs and allowed them all to grow together. It was one single organ in the body that they had uh, cut in a T-shaped fashion, looking at the different chambers and whatnot in there. And uh, I think it's this this organ-looking thing uh, was apparently performing many functions. Uh, so it, again, it, it appeared to be biological to you in the photos. Yeah, so I, I it, yeah, exactly. It, it didn't appear to be an interdimensional being, or but yeah, I again, I don't know. Can an interdimensional being be be uh, appear yeah. to be biological? So I, that, that's all I can say. Uh, well, didn't you get a glimpse of something in a lab coat? Yeah, oh boy, people make a big deal about that thing. Well, and yeah, and rightfully so. I mean, <laughs> no, I don't think that was an alien. No, just a short uh, person with a big gray head, or no, I didn't say anything about a big gray head. <laughs> I'm just, uh, I'm now, just the other side of the coin is that they were could have been playing mind games. So they had two scientists in lab coats stand next to a facsimile of a kid, a gray alien. Even well, I mean, you, you know, when... a lot was going on at that time because I saw, again, this was their, you know, backs are to me and they were playing with something or looking at something that size. Maybe they were making up a little mannequin or something to see how it would fit inside the craft. But I had no indication that that thing was alive or right. what was going on. So I, I can never say that that. But neither did they know you would be walking down the hall to go to the bathroom and look through that window. Yeah, but I wouldn't try and read too much into that. That would be too much speculation. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try to take one more call. Got to be a quick one. Uh, Gary in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Quick question. Well, more of a statement. Okay. In 1966, I was the youngest person working for an electronics company who delivered projects to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is now NASA. And normally I was kept out of the loop as to what they did, but this one particular time I walked through a door that I wasn't supposed to, and there on the easel by an illustrator who was incredible by the name of Glenn Hawk, was the space shuttle, 1966. It did not fly till 1981. So this suppression of information has been going on for eons. Well, point well taken, and I think uh, Bob and, and John and Gene are sort of examples of, uh, of uh, what our knowledge is, is of suppression of this kind of technology. Yes. Uh, any closing comments uh, from... From our guests, Bob, anything you want the listeners to know about what's next for you or, or what this uh, strange journey has been like? Well, the strange journey has really been something. Uh, certainly, it has taken my life in directions I never thought it would. Uh, I do constantly get uh, people that are, you know, really wanting to ask me questions, even people doing research and uh, looking for – Actually, even a couple in a couple instances, some research labs that are looking at advanced propulsion and just looking for some possible insight. And I apologize for not getting back to everybody, but if you do want to contact me, just be, be patient. And the only place is uh, uh, our website.